Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's Yonville Town Council meeting for December 6th, 2011. We did convene earlier in order to interview an applicant for the Napa County Mosquito Abatement Board of Directors uh, Yonville representative position, but this is uh, our regular meeting, so I'll convene this meeting to order, and we'll start first with roll call, please. Councilmember Hall? Here. Councilmember Moeller? Here. Councilmember Dornbecker? Here. Vice Mayor Tilton? Here. Mayor Dunbar? Here. And before we move on to the Pledge of Allegiance, I do just want to recognize and ask for uh, a moment of silence in memory of George Crane, who passed away uh, this last week. He was a member of our Community Hall Commission as well as a very active uh, member in our community. So if you could all join me in a moment of silence. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Now let's move on to the Pledge of Allegiance. If you can, please stand and join us. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, one nation under God, God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. <coughs> move on to item six, closed session report. We have none, I believe. <coughs> We will move on then to the adoption of tonight's agenda. Do we have any changes or corrections? I believe there will be a, uh, a change to one of the consent items. Is uh, there? That's correct, Mayor. With your concurrence, we're recommending pulling item D because we have a revised resolution uh, that we want to make sure everybody understands. So we'll pull item 9D, as in David, uh, when that time comes in just a moment. Any other corrections or changes? With that, uh, can we have a motion to adopt the amended agenda? Move to adopt with amendment. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you very much. Let's move on to tonight's public comment. So this is an opportunity for anyone in the community that would like to speak on an item that's not listed on tonight's agenda to please come forward and do so. And I do believe that we have at least one. So please. Mr. Warnerberg, join us in. Do you know where the button is? Yeah. You, can, you can magically make it rise. Excellent. Welcome. Uh, hi, I'm Rob Warnerberg, 2028 Adams Street in Yonville. Um, I'm also one of the steering committee members for the Yonville Arts Committee, and I just wanted to come up and say a couple things that we're doing. Uh, one thing is we're in the process of doing our annual, uh, first annual, let's put it that way, uh, calendar sale. We've produced a calendar that's um, of Yonville by Yonville photographers for Yonville. Sorry, I don't have one here, of course. Oh, we've got new cameras, too. That's nice. Um, uh, but I don't have one here for you. But you know what? You can come on Sunday is the um, Locals Emerging Artist uh, Artist Reception. It will be Sunday at the Community Center. We're going to be in both buildings from 3 p.m. till 5 p.m. We're going to do wine, chocolates, even though I've been told those don't go together, no matter what anybody tells you. Um, and it's going to be local artists. The idea is we collect an emerging artist um, to come and uh, present their work in the gallery at the community center and it's just one of our uh, annual uh, Yonville Arts events we do a bunch of these and I just want to come and let everybody invite everybody out there and in here uh, to come this Sunday probably be inside because it's going to be cold but uh, come have fun with us and also I understand you're going to be uh, offering a special discounted price of the calendars Thursday at the tree lighting yeah so the tree lighting um, actually uh, we're going to have some Yonville Arts Committee members there, um, and they will be offering them at kind of a discount Christmas um, holiday season time. And again, these are all photos of Yonville. They're gorgeous photos. The photographers are, the photographers are Angie Johnson, Mars Lazar, uh, myself, and Michael Scher. Um, so uh, come out, get a calendar, and have fun. You're forgetting V. Oh, and V. Bataro. Sorry. Yes. Uh, her pictures are gorgeous. Thank you very right, much. Any other members of the public, would uh, you like to come at this time? Now would be the time to speak on something not on tonight's agenda. Seeing no one else, we'll move on to the consent <laughs> calendar. And we have already acknowledged that we're going to be pulling item 9D. And when we do that, I will be um, stepping down because I have a conflict on that item due to the location of my uh, residence. 
and Vice Mayor Chilton will be handling that. Are there any other questions of consent calendar items, or is there a motion? Motion to approve consent calendar. And that would be for items? A, B, C, uh, E, and F. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. So with that, I am going to step down briefly, and Vice Mayor will handle item 9D. All right, moving to a consent calendar item 9D. Can staff give us a real quick update on the changes to the resolution? Staff recommendation is very minor. Um, with the cooperation of all the parties, uh, we changed from a lean approach to a condition approach to uh, ensure that the necessary access road and the bioswale would be completed. We found a way that was uh, a workable achievement. So this resolution reflects that proposal. Uh, all parties have agreed to that. Public Works Department is comfortable. Planning is comfortable. Uh, town attorney is comfortable. Uh, and the applicant and their legal team are all comfortable. And believe it or not, we actually came up with something that is simpler and cheaper. Any questions from the council? Any other statements since we opened this up? No. Uh, is there a motion? Uh, I guess motion to approve resolution 3002-11 accepting the public improvements constructed on Stags View Lane and Yachtville Crossroad as part of the Vineyard Oaks Knight Subdivision APN 036-040-011. I'll second with the changes. Oh, uh, as, as changed. Thank you. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 None opposed. That motion passes unanimously. And we will invite the mayor back. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Sorry, I didn't hear you. <laughs> okay, uh, so we are moving on now to uh, item 10. And before we do that, um, I did just want to recognize we have some special guests that just showed up tonight uh, from the Yountville Troop 4 Boy Scouts. Just wanted to say hello, guys, and thank you for being here tonight. So let's move on now to our presentations and first what we would like to do tonight we have two very special presentations of longtime uh, very loyal very um, talented skillful uh, public works uh, employees of the town of Yonville that we're recognizing tonight and the first one um, Sam is not here but I want to still recognize the retirement of uh, Sam Chesbro Public Works Wastewater Treatment Plan Operator for over 29 years here in the town of Yonville. I know the uh, town manager wanted to make a few comments before I show the uh, the uh, presentation gift. Actually, one of the things that in, in researching and looking at this, um, I've kind of mixed them together because their history and their career and the paths that they crossed in Yonville overlap. So but. before you just do that, then let me just also just say that our other special guest tonight is Barney LaRue, who's been a public works supervisor for 26, 26 years. We got that right? So thank you for being here and, and uh, listen up. We'll make sure we have uh, everything right. As you've alluded to, we have a very unique opportunity tonight, and it's not often in an organization where we have two employees that have combined with over 55 years of service. And <clears throat> I think it's important that we take a moment and acknowledge not only their contributions, but I want to put the significance of this accomplishment in a little bit of perspective. To do so, consider the following. Yountville was incorporated in 1965 and is approaching its 46th anniversary and working towards 50. Sam Chesborough has worked for Yountville for 29 of those 46 years or 63% of our incorporated history. Likewise, Barney LaRue has worked for the town for 57% of its incorporated history. That's, that's significant, that's kind of unique. 
Sam was actually hired in 1982 by the first town administrator, John Lander, who shortly retired thereafter. I'm not really sure Sam had any influence in that decision. And Barney was actually hired in 1985 by the town's second administrator, Robert Myers. Both worked with Pete Bartisano and Steve Rosa in their capacities in that time period as public works superintendent and chief utility operator for the wastewater treatment plant. A few other things to put in perspective. In 1982, the price of a gallon of gas in Napa was 52 cents. In 1985, a loaf of bread cost 55 cents. And for those of you that may remember, St. Elmo's Fire was Billboard's number one uh, chart-topping song of 1985. Needless to say, a lot has changed in Yountville since those days. Both Sam and Barney have been involved in the town's response to three significant flood events, those being the 1986 flood, 1995, 2005. You know, note that I'm a little worried because they seem to be coming every decade and we haven't had one yet in the, the area, and ultimately have been involved in the construction and management of the flood wall. They've been involved with every Taste of Yountville event and almost every Festival of Lights. They've overseen and been involved in the change from when there was a fire station at Vandalier Park to what is now Vandalier Park. Mm -hmm. They've helped to create a number of town floats for the Yountville Days Parade and were actively involved in the physical construction of the garage, garage at the corporation yard in the mid-1980s. The late 1980s renovation of Community Hall and the 2009 construction and renovation of the community center project and community hall renovation. They've both been instrumental in the Public Works Department entries in the Chamber of Commerce Chile Cook-Off, where both the Public Works Department entry Chile and Salsa have brought home trophies. They can both recall a time when the former Gordon's Market was a market, um, and they can probably remember a few times when food wasn't quite as fancy as it is now. They can recall when there weren't housing units in Washington Park and Forester Park, when we had less than 500 water accounts. There was no Bellagio Inn and Spa. There were more than a dozen drinking establishments in Yountville, but they weren't tasting rooms. And in general, I think it's fair to say, the Yountville that they started in in the 1980s was a far cry from the Yountville of 2011. Um, Sam Chesborough was hired on November 16, 1982, as a grade one wastewater treatment plant operator. In those days, the Public Works Department was actually very small. The emphasis was on the operation of the wastewater treatment plant, and there were actually four employees involved in the wastewater treatment plant operation. And that part really hasn't changed a whole lot in terms of staffing size for the wastewater treatment plant. But most people started out in the wastewater treatment plant. Um, and at that point in time, there were actually only 10 total city employees. There was no park and rec programming, and the park's maintenance and things were very non-existent. Sam has had a significant hand in running and the maintenance of our wastewater treatment plant during his tenure with the town. He has rebuilt at one point in time or another almost every piece of equipment in the wastewater treatment plant and the pump stations. In 2000, uh, he took on the role of the town mechanic and has oversaw the maintenance and repair of our fleet of equipment, and more importantly, our lawnmowers and things like that that generally get used. He's been involved in a wide variety of projects, including the 2002 bocce court renovations, the swimming pool renovation project, the Title 22 upgrades to the wastewater treatment plant, running our sign machine that helps to create our unique signage in Yountville, and helping to set up the maintenance programming for our new community center. Barney LaRue was hired by the town as a maintenance worker too on August 19, 1985. He became a wastewater treatment plant operator in 1987, following that same path that I told you there was a lot of folks that was the focus. In 1988, though, he was promoted to a public works maintenance worker three or what in his official jacket was referred to as Maintenance Man 3. Times have changed a little bit. 
Subsequently, in January of 1990, he was promoted to the public facilities and water system supervisor position. Barney has been involved and supervised the installation of, and at this point in his career, the replacement of every, practically every water meter that's been installed in the town's water system. He supervised the construction and implementation of the town's unique signage and signa or signature signage program. For many of you that aren't aware, we don't have the typical standard street signs, and we have a very unique approach to how we frame and identify and use wood frainage. It doesn't happen overnight, and it takes talent and dedication by our crews to make it happen. Um, when we took on the renovation of the veterans home pool as a community pool, Barney stepped up and became a certified pool operator. He's been involved in the construction and maintenance of the various paths along Hopper Creek, the various installations of playground equipment, and in this time, the replacement of the playground equipment that we installed in the 80s and 90s because times have changed and those things are no longer compliant. The construction of the Yountville Mile Bike Path uh, and the enhancements and restroom improvements, and probably most importantly for a lot of town staff, numerous requests to keep things fixed at Town Hall, the community center, and the post office. So at this point, I think it's really important that we make a footnote that Sam and Barney have had a significant impact on the town of Yountville. And I hope that in their own way, they can drive around and take a look and realize that you know, their contributions have helped to make Yountville what it is and have had an impact in the quality of life that we all enjoy. So with that, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you very much, and you've done a great job of, of uh, bringing those 50 plus years of of service to our community so that some of us that weren't here in the beginning really understand how long and tenured your commitment to the town of Yountville has been. Um, I personally want to thank you, Barney, and, and Sam, and I know some of the other guys helped, but you two are instrumental in our World Trade Center Memorial. Um, so many times I was out there, whether it was literally bringing the steel from Napa to the courtyard, from the courtyard down here, and I know you almost lost a, a toe or two when you were installing it and, and doing all the work. It's, a, it's an amazing memorial that we have here that you should be very proud of. So thank you, and thank you to Sam as well. Um, with, with that, and I know I, I'll give uh, council opportunity to, to uh, make a comment if they would like, but if I could ask you, Barney, to join me at the uh, podium, I do have a presentation I'd like to give you. And you'll see in a moment why I'm not having you take Sam's uh, presentation with you because it's not that I don't trust you but <laughs> I don't trust you the first time I get to do this. Cool, huh? yeah. Did you build this? No. You could have. <laughs> so I just wanted to say, and yes, this is a local uh, wine producer that has helped supply this, but this is a, a special engraved uh, bottle of wine that says, uh, has the town of Yonfield's logo presented to Barney LaRue in appreciation for 26 years of outstanding service and dedication to the town and dated December 31st, 2011, from the town of Yountville's town council and staff. Nice. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I don't uh, speak well in crowds or groups, so, um, but I will say that over these years, I, I did grow up here as a child, and we moved here, my family moved here in the 60s, so. I have seen a lot of changes in Yachtville, and I have to say that it is probably one of the most beautiful towns now. Uh, I'm not saying it wasn't nice back then, it was farmlands, but it's really grown, and I'm really proud and honored to say that I am from Yachtville and worked here. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. thank you again, Barney, and we're <coughs> Going to uh, entrust Sam's bottle with uh, our town clerk. We Thank you. 
I'm not sure we're okay with that, but at least he knows where it is. Um, and I see, I think, did we get a few more Troop 4 uh, members here? Yep. Thank you all for coming. We were acknowledging some of your fellow Boy Scouts, but thanks, thanks for being here. Uh, let's move on to our next presentation, which is the Napa County Measure A Financial Oversight Committee Annual Update, and it will be presented by our Yonkville representative, James Shue. Welcome. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, staff members. I'm here tonight as your appointed representative to the Napa County Measure A Financial Oversight Committee. I'd like to assure Steve Rogers that I did not drive my golf cart down here tonight. <laughs> Measure A is a funding source of the Napa County Flood Control Project, which is a 20-year project enacted in 1997 and will be in effect until the year 2018. The project has a total anticipated revenue budget of approximately $200 million, or approximately $10 million a year. These funds, by law, are to be expended exclusively for projects consistent with the, for the, with the purpose of Measure A, which is flood control and protection for the, for the citizens and the property within Napa County. Since its inception in 1997, through June, 20, June 30th, 2011, the Flood Control Authority has received total revenues of $248,241,000 of which $151,707,000 came directly from Measure A sales tax funds and the remaining balance of $96,534,000 coming from other sources such as interest and bond revenue, etc. During that same time period, the authority has expended $195,647,000 on approved projects and administrative expenses, leaving a fund balance of $52,594,000 as of June 30, 2011. The completed annual financial statements and mandated formal audit for that period is available online and through the authority office. Measure A funds are allocated to each of the desig designated communities on the basis of their proportionate share of sales tax received in the year 1996. The original distribution was as follows. City of Napa received 66.6%. .6 City of American Canyon received 6.7%. City of Calistoga, 3.3%. City of St. Helena, 11.5%. And the town of Yountville, 2.3%. The Napa County unincorporated area, 9.6%. The Joint Powers Agreement requires that these percentages be reviewed at least twice during the term of Measure A. Subsequently, that review has increased the town of Yountville's allocation from 2.3% to 3.2% in the fiscal year 2010-2011. The town of Yountville has received a total revenue of 3,587,000 through June 30, 2011, generating expenses of 2,253,000, leaving a fund balance of $1,334,000. Those expenses consist of project expenses of $2,158,000, future maintenance fund of $78,924, administrative expenses of 15473 for total expenditures of $2,253,000. The current project scheduled for funding in the coming fiscal year for the town of Yountville is as follows. Number one is a payment of debt service for flood wall lease purchase cert certificate of participation of $265,970. This amount will cover the annual amount due for the principal, interest, and bank fees for the debt issued for the construction of the flood wall around Rancho de Napa and Gateway, Gateway Mobile Home Parks. Number two, the Beard Ditch Bank Repair, repair of $142,000. This project is a bank stabilization project on the east side of Beard Ditch and across from the, the, from the pumps at the flood wall that will be constructed in the summer of 2011. 
$123,000 has been allocated to the hydrologic study of Hopper and Hinman Creek Watershed Phase Two. Further details on these projects and the 11 other projects under consideration in the remaining years of Measure A program can be found in the annual report presented to the Financial Oversight Committee by Kathleen Bradbury, Finance Director of the Town of Yountville on August 3, 2011. The authority to expend Measure A funds for approved projects rests with the Napa County Flood Protection and Watershed Improvement Authority, which is made up of the Napa County Board of Supervisors. This authority, guided by their professional staff, have the sole responsibility of approving, <coughs> pardon me, or disapproving all of the projects brought before them. The Financial Oversight Committee, which was established by the Flood Protection and Watershed Authority, has two primary functions. Number one, providing the public with information regarding the manner in which the expenditure of flood protection sales tax proceeds have occurred. Number two is making recommendations to the district regarding replacement projects as required by Measure A. In regard to those responsibilities, there is an existing issue that has developed in the last few months concerning the City of Calistoga and the expenditure of Measure A funds to construct the Mount Washington water tank. This issue has been brought before the public, but at the present time, there is pending litigation scheduled for early January 12, 2012, and the members of the Financial Oversight Committee have been advised by the Napa County Council that under the provisions of the Brown Act, they should not make public comments, so I won't. Are there any questions? Thank you. Very, let me first say thank you on behalf of the council for the very thorough report and good background to help uh, the public understand the measure A funds and what they have done to benefit our community. So, uh, are there any questions about uh, Representative Shoup's uh, report? I'd just like to Councilor make a Hall. comment and thank you for that. I <clears throat> I sit on the Watershed Information Con uh, Conservation Commission and they also reported on Measure A and, and you touched on some very specific things that were directly affected to Yonville and, that, and that's really helpful um, and thank you again for your, your support and oversight. That's uh, it's really been a benefit for the organ for the town and um, we won't have a lot of money left it sounds like uh, in the very near future but we don't, do we know if there's a plan to extend or look for another set of measures? I mean, there, there's a lot more flood work that might be done. Is there plans in the future for that? Well, as Kathleen pointed out in her report, there are other, there are 11 other projects that, that, uh, that the town is looking at to expend these funds on. And you, you want me to tell you about each one of them? No, no, no. <laughs> but I, I guess my question is, is beyond Measure A, when it's wrapped up in 2018, is there any expectation with the people that are currently overviewing or, or reviewing it, it or having oversight of it that there will be looking forward to doing this again because I mean I think it's going to sunset and I believe they've got all the money earmarked but is there an expectation that they're going to do something else there's a lot of discussion on either either side of that that discussion whether they should they should sunset it or keep it or, or, right. or close it down okay so don't know that's where we are yeah. <laughs> a lot of talk about it yeah. they've got seven years to think about it yeah that time goes fast yeah thank you any other questions from council? No, thanks very much for a very thorough report. Appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, we are going to move on to our uh, item 11 public hearing. Our one public hearing this evening is related to Napa Valley Lodge Master Development Plan Amendment and Sign Permit. And the address is 2230 Madison Street. And before we proceed, I believe that we have at least one uh, conflict. Yes, Mr. Mayor, I'm going to step down from this discussion as California um, laws require me as a business owner who does more than $500 of business with uh, an entity, which is Napa Valley Lodge, uh, not to participate in this discussion. So I will step out. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Um, Mayor, yes. I have a disclosure. Um, I've consulted, consulted with the town attorney. He's advised me that while discussion on uh, lodging facilities um, is within the, within the town of Yonville will have no direct impact upon the operations of my employer, Cliff Lady Vineyards and the Poetry Inn, to the extent that there may be indirect impacts upon my employer. These economic impacts are not significant enough 
under the regulations of the FPPC to result in my disqualification. At this time, I elect to participate, but I'm required to disclose that I'm an employee of Cliff Lady Vineyards and the Poetry Inn, serving as its Vice President of Finance. Thank you very much. I think that is it for disclosures. So with that, uh, may we have a staff report, please? Good evening. Tonight, you have before you a master development plan amendment and sign permit for the Napa Valley Lodge. And the first portion of this project is the master development plan amendment, which includes design review for the landscape and hardscape improvements in the area of the hotel entry, the corner, and along both street frontages. This slide shows photos of existing conditions and the existing cypress hedge and the associated landscaping will be removed to prepare the site for the renovation. Two new stone landscape walls are proposed and they will create a berm for landscape plantings of red fescue and lavender. The lower wall is a 36 inch tall wall that will uh, be constructed to the back side of the new sidewalk that wraps around the corner and the taller wall will be an approximately eight foot tall wall um, that will be set back approximately four feet from the Washington Street um, sidewalk. Um, the taller wall will replace the existing cypress hedge but rather than extending all the way to the columns of the port cocher it has been pulled back to invite views and glimpses into the site. You can see here there's a second live oak proposed for Washington Street to uh, complement the existing one on Madison and create some balance and symmetry for the site. There are several new stone um, pilasters that are proposed and there there will be 48 inch cubes at each of the driveway entrances and there will be a row of 36 inch square six foot tall pilasters um, that will be incorporated into the hedge on Madison and this hedge screens the parking lot. Um, each of the uh, pilasters and the walls will be uh, will feature a uh, upper stone ledge that will have LED um, strip lighting on the underside and the intent is to gently wash the stone wall. The same stone that you see on these walls will also be incorporated um, onto the columns of the port cocher, the base of the fountain and the fireplace. And the idea is to, um, for the stone to be a unifying element in the design um, and to create a, a stronger identity for the hotel. Um, this, and the stone is shown here along with the landscape plantings. Now the eight foot section of wall exceeds the six foot height limit for walls and for this reason an exception with the associated findings is required. Um, and it's the type of finding that um, may be made for a master sign plan, for a, a master development plan property such as this. Um, and it specifically references exceptions to wall height limit. And it's not an exception that would generally apply to other properties in towns and specifically not single family residential um, properties and walls on those properties. Um, and there are unique circumstances that apply to this property. It's not just its location at this corner intersection, but the location of the buildings and other improvements closer to the street, some of which are indeed in the right of way. And at this location, there are heightened impacts from um, light and noise um, and visual impacts as well. Um, so the proposed stone wall is significantly shorter than the existing Cypress Hedge um, by at least half. And its length is also much shorter approximately by half as well since it's, um, the terminus has been pulled back from the Port Cochere. Um, what this does is reduce massing in the area while inviting views into the site, at the same time mitigating these impacts from this corner location. As I noted, there are many, um, I'll go back to a better photo. As I noted, 
um, there are right-of-way issues with this project because many of the proposed improvements are located in the right-of-way as are existing improvements. Um, and this condition of the project improvements and right-of-way needs to be corrected. Um, so the town intends to grant ownership to the applicant um, in consideration of the applicant completing um, off-site improvements in conjunction with the project. And these improvements include um, constructing new si a new sidewalk along Washington Street, uh, replacing the storm drain and uh, drain inlet that would be located beneath this sidewalk, and establishing a new crosswalk connection with, um, with Yountville Park. The second part of this application is for <coughs> sign permit for the new business identification signage. And the um, existing signs on the columns of the Port Cochere will be removed and three new signs are proposed. The first is the main business identification sign shown um, on the lower portion of this slide. It would be located on the taller of the two stone walls at the corner and it's an approximately um, 15 square foot sign that would be lighted from above by the recessed LED lighting on the underside of that stone ledge and from below um, with LED up lights that will be fitted with glare shields in the planters. The other two proposed signs will, are identical signs that will be located on pilasters um, at the main driveway and it's shown uh, on the upper left of this slide. It's in a, they'll each be approximately seven square feet. They'll feature Napa Valley Lodge and the street number of 2230 in a stacked configuration. Um, these two will be lighted from above and below with the LED lighting. Um, total proposed signage is just under 29 square feet and this is within the 45 square feet um, that the Napa Valley Lodge is permitted. And that's in addition to an existing 39 square foot um, Highway 29 sign, which is considered, which is a sign that's in addition to all other allowable signs. These are freestanding signs and they need to have special findings made for them as freestanding signs. And the code defines a freestanding sign as any sign standing alone or on its own foundation that's not attached to a building. And I'd just like to note the staff is working on revised definitions for freestanding sign and sign display area. And that's because the existing definitions fail to acknowledge the different types of structures that signs may be affixed to. And the code is silent on how to calculate um, sign area except for a building mounted sign. So a reasonable interpretation of the sign ordinance um, is that a sign affixed to a wall should be calculated by boxing the copy <coughs> in parallel um, lines rather than calculating the entire area of the wall and compute it as such the proposed signs are within the, um, the maximum allowed. And so staff is recommending approval of both the master development plan amendment with the exception for the eight foot wall height and the sign permit. So the only two findings are specific to those two items. It has nothing to do with the encroachment into the, the right of way uh, that's proposed with the new sidewalk. The encroachment will be corrected when the town um, does a lot line adjustment and transfers a property via grant deed to the applicant. Okay, so the only exceptions, I'll call them exceptions, you're calling them findings. Correct. Um, the, two, the two signs and the um, eight foot wall height of the interior wall. Yes. Proposed. Okay. Um, are there any questions about the uh, staff report? Councilmember Moeller. Um, my microphone here. In the first page, I was, I'm confused about uh, the width of the sidewalks. In the staff report, um, it says the sidewalk will be four feet on Madison and five feet on Washington. But then there seems to be a lot of discussion under the ZDRB about making the sidewalk five feet on Washington. Can you kind of fill yes. us in on that? So the project description describes the project after it went to the ZDRB. So it sh um, shows a sidewalk on Washington that increased from four foot as presented to the ZDRB to five feet. Um, and I explain that further at the end of the ZDRB comments and the changes that the applicant made. So I was okay. hoping that would be clear. Okay, um, got it. Thanks. 
And then that five-foot sidewalk on Washington, however, does exceed the, the minimum requirement for ADA, um, and there's a note in the staff report that perhaps that could be um, reduced. So, so uh, before you do that, what, I, what I'll uh, just highlight for folks that may have listened to the ZDRB uh, discussion of this item, on the fourth page of the report, there are four modifications from that original presentation that have to do with the uh, five-foot sidewalk, as was just uh, described, the separation between the eight-foot wall and the back of the sidewalk, uh, extension of the sidewalk on Washington further north, and then um, submitted a line of sight. So this is just additional information, this line of sight drawing Correct. that was uh, added to the uh, application since the ZDRB's review. So, uh, Councilmember Muller, did you have any other questions at this time? No, I, I think I understand it. They're they're being proposed as 48 inch sidewalks. They're correct on all sides. No, it's okay. a Sorry, it's nine. a the four foot sidewalk on Madison, correct. but a five foot sidewalk on Washington, and the reason was it was adjacent to the taller wall, yes. um, and and the town practice is to have five foot sidewalks in town. Although this is at the north end in an area that's a little more rural, okay. uh, even though it does provide access to the park. Okay. Okay, and I, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I want to make sure that I also understood that part of uh, part of this project by giving up the right of way or granting the additional space is to include a crosswalk that would go from uh, the facility itself over to the park. That's correct. Correct. Okay. I thought I read that as well. I, I also want to just footnote that this project has pre-existing right-of-way issues, and this project attempts to fix that. And what I mean by that is previously, for some reason or another, there are attributes of the existing development that are in the town's public right-of-way. So the, the existing... Uh, part of the existing fountain and some of that. So that's why staff is trying to clean this up. This is uh, property line adjustment. It's not unique. Uh, we run into this periodically in Old Town, but we are trying to um, correct and make sure from a legal and liability that they have what they need to have. I do want to point out that the town has evaluated to ensure that the appropriate easements and right away for Washington and Madison are retained. Uh, but in this particular case, the sidewalks and improvements, et cetera, will ultimately be going on their property rather than on the town, so that has some, some positives. Uh, there is the footnote that there will be a storm drainage improvement in which the town will be participating because a part of that project extends beyond, and when you're doing drainage, you need to make sure, you know, widening the middle section of the length isn't going to help the overall improvement. So I do want to make sure that people are aware of that. Thank you. Councilor, or Councilor I have just yes. one other. Could you show me on the diagram where the new storm drain, because they're, they're replacing a storm drain, but they're going to have to move it. Where is that going to end up at? It's, it's, right. it's in this location, and it goes under the sidewalk. It continues past the project um, up to about here and crosses over to the park, and that's the reason the town um, would like to have the work all done at once but would contribute to the scope of the work for the, to, for the upgrade and the improvement. And, and the town's expectation is that we're going to participate in 50% of that that proposed project. Is that correct? In the storm drain replacement portion of the project, right? Okay. And that's planned and budgeted in our CIP? There is budget for the CIP. Sorry, can you make sure that everybody hear that, Graham? Yeah, the, fund, the town has in the capital improvement program annual storm drainage funding. Uh, we had some projects identified, but we could spend the money here if they move forward with this project. I mean, this is a good case where the applicant has come forward and here's an opportunity to make a uh, collectively work on a comprehensive improvement to the north end and, and look at several things. As an illustration, the applicant wants to put the sidewalks in to improve the aesthetics. Well, we don't want to put sidewalks on front on top of a storm drain that we're going to come back two years and need to work on. So. We're trying to take a holistic approach and be proactive at resolving all of the various things uh, while also tying in the anticipated North Yountville bike path improvements that will tie into the park as well. So over the next two years with this project, the North Yountville bike path and the improvements with Hillstone will, will create a very positive, we believe, uh, North Yountville entrance to the community. 
This is also um, w the drainage for the Hillstone R&D kitchen project will also improve that drainage there. So by doing this, this is the downstream portion, and then we'll talk to them about doing the work on the south side of Washington and Madison. And my <clears throat> my only rationale for asking that question is that are we are we moving into a storm drain project uh, transition that we wouldn't have done if this project had not come up at this point in time? Because then we're accelerating our use of funds for those types of activities. I, I think that's a fair uh, uh, council member Hall. But as we talked before, sometimes we have to be flexible because we see an opportunity. We have a modest storm drain budget, and we prioritize, and, and this will fix something. Uh, part of the storm drainage and the pipe are in the area that is lower, shallow, and it's covered with gravel. So part of that, you know, that now makes more sense to to improve upon it than it does when the improvements. But no, if you were to ask us and look in the budget, did, did we anticipate spending twenty-five or thirty thousand on this project this year? The answer would be no. But I do think there's an opportunity, much like we've taken that approach to other sidewalks, utility undergrounding, et cetera, to work on uh, in partnership with the private sector when there's opportunities that make sense. And in this case, it does. Every budget has to be flexible. I recognize that. Thank you. Councilmember okay. Dornbecker, questions about the staff report? Yes, please. I noticed uh, as I read through the staff report, and especially in the Zoning and Design Review Board comments, that um, several of the members of the Zoning and Design Review Board talked about the, um, the larger wall that should be a maximum of six feet in height with a two-foot extension, but I didn't see any mention of what that two-foot extension would either be composed of or comprised of or look like. That's a standard very often used um, for residential properties, and it generally takes the form of a six-foot tall wooden fence with two foot of lattice attached to the top um, that an owner could grow um, vines on. Um, it's a very different application um, of a, a height limit um, when considering this architectural type wall that serves different purposes. It's not a, um, a wall on a property line. Um, so. That's why we included the discussion of um, the unique circumstances on this property, why, um, why we believe an eight-foot tall um, in this specific instance um, may be permitted. What I understand, it was because of the automobiles turning in that intersection and the uh, resulting glare of the lights into the lobby and the area in the um, hotel. Is that correct? In addition to pedestrian um, line of sight into the area um, and sound attenuation purposes, a um, number of reasons to have the taller wall. And I'll go to the, the line of sight um, image the applicant submitted after the ZDRB meeting um, showing um, that if the wall were shorter, um, it may uh, produce less privacy from site impacts in this area. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I do have a couple of questions, and I'll stay on that topic for now. Um, just to clarify once again, you've already differentiated the difference between the enforcement of the height of fences and walls for private property when they basically split two yards, and it's an issue of uh, privacy and, and um, from one, one residence to another, mm -hmm. and that you're applying a different set of circumstances here being not only uh, commercial property, but also being at an intersection, not dividing this parcel from any other really uh, adjacent parcel. I know, interestingly enough, the hedge was originally apparently required to to screen the statue that some found inappropriate, um, but you've also acknowledged that this screening would be at least a 50 percent, if not more, reduction in height of that screening, so there'd be a, a lessening of the massing of the screen, even though it goes from a, a landscape <laughs> item to a stone wall item. Correct. And it's not um, just the height, but it's the distance that the wall would span. As I mentioned here, the, um, the hedge continued all the way to the Port Cochere, so it's been pulled back on both sides. So now there are views into um, of the fountain and the art. Two, the other two issues I have to address, one, you just touched on, Graham, actually about um, how this relates to the overall intersection site improvements. 
could you explain maybe a little bit more how this marries with what has already been approved with Hillstone, what our intentions are with that Madison Washington intersection and how this helps just pedestrian traffic flow in general to get in and out of the park. Okay. Um, with the North Hillfield bike route, we were looking at um, essentially picking up the bike path on the highway. R&D Kitchen with the Hillstone project would have a, a path along the north side of, I'm sorry, the south side of Madison that would bring people to the intersection uh, with the North Yonville bike route project. We would be redoing the crosswalks in the intersection. Uh, we're looking at the stamped concrete, which we have in other places. Uh, and then it was going to build a sidewalk along the west side of Washington and then have a crosswalk over to Yonville Community Park so that there would be a pathway from town and from the bike path along Highway 29 to the park. Uh, with this project coming forward with an application, uh, we gave the architect engineer a set of plans from the project. <laughs> they included those into their um, drawings for this for this project. So essentially, they'll be building a piece of the North Yonkville bike route project, just as the Hillstone Group will be building a piece of the North Yonkville bike route project on their property. So, <laughs> as these developments move forward, instead of us going asking the property owner to build something on or next to their property, they're coming to the town saying we like to do a project and they build a piece for us. Um, and then with the drainage, um, we found with the uh, Hillstone Group and RD Kitchen application that the drainage is not the best out there and it would be a good time to upgrade the storm drainage system before we put in the new sidewalks. So that's sort of how the, the projects all, all fit together, if that answers your question. Yes, it does. and, and I. You know, compare this, uh, though very different projects, to uh, the intersection at um, Yount and Washington in front of Hurley's parking lot, for example, to craft a more fluid uh, pedestrian sidewalk area that didn't used to exist. We're basically kind of doing the same thing here, making a kind of an um, almost impassable area flow with the existing sidewalk to the south of Washington. Right. The other thing we're doing is um, they'll be putting in the buff colored concrete, which is what was put in at Hotel Luca and at the bus stop and what R&D Kitchen will be doing. So that whole north part of town near that intersection will have the, the, the sort of the beige brownish colored concrete. So they'll all match. Okay. The last question uh, has to do with that sidewalk along Washington Street. And I know that it kind of turns into a de facto parking area for some folks, especially during special events. What is the impact of making that a five-foot sidewalk in terms of parking along that side, that southwest side of Washington? Does it completely go away because it would now block the drive aisle, or is there sufficient space to have parking on both on that one side of the street? Because the other side of the street is already a, a very steep gravel slope mm -hmm. that people aren't really supposed to use to park anyway. Yeah, there really hasn't been much room for parking here at the intersection as as people come the park Yonville Community Park is here. As you come down Washington Street, people have been parking on both sides of the street for Yonville days or whatever. Um, they'll my understanding continue to be able to park here um, if we with the right of way we can retain an easement. Um, this area here has not been very good for parking. Um, so we'll probably um, we're looking at having the, the width here enough for trucks to turn and things like and bikes, but uh, not to be parking along between the driveway on Washington Street and the intersection of Washington and Madison. But the the longer straight stretch, the where the property line would be changed. Is there parking proposed on that west side and still leaving room for driving, or is it no parking there? Actually. Technically, it's no parking there already. It, it people, actually, people no, that's, that's a very good question, and I want to draw your attention to um, condition number 11 under public works condition. That area is sort of graveled right now and is parked on, and we are retaining one of the conditions is easements for public parking and public utilities along Washington Street frontage will be provided. The expectation is that that area will continue where the sidewalk where the sidewalk is going right now, people rarely park because that's really tight, close to the driveway entry and the intersection. We do want to maintain as much access for parking because that parking is also utilized by the employees of Napa Valley Lodge as well as the community. So we want to try to retain that, and they've been very receptive. So while we're transferring that, we are putting the easement condition to maintain parking. 
we don't need to worry about any street lights along the stretch of the sidewalk? Um, the street lights are, if I remember correctly, there's one over near the park and there's one down near the intersection here. So uh, there's also lights with the R&D kitchen project will be replaced. Um, and I can't remember if there's one on this side. The the biggest concern I have is with we're installing a new crosswalk. Mm -hmm. We don't we don't want to do it in the dark. Right. You know, we just got rid of a, a couple areas in town that were darker than we wanted where we were encouraging people to cross the street. So you're saying there's an existing one at the point of the right. park. There should be one here at Lincoln and Washington if I remember correctly. And that can that can support that crossing then. Those are Cobra lights, and as part of the Yountville bike path, we may look at that's on our radar screen to look at lighting improvements to build upon that. Okay. Those are my questions for now. I will go ahead and open the public hearing portion of this item and encourage the applicant if uh, they would like to address the project to do so now, and then we'll open it up to uh, public for their comments and questions. Welcome. Uh, good evening. My name is Simon Phillips. I'm the landscape architect on the project. Um, I was going to give a little presentation, but it seems like everyone has a pretty good understanding here of what we're doing. So, um, Is there it, anything that was left out or incorrect? <laughs> there's, a, there's a couple items I'd like to, <coughs> like to go into. Okay. Um, just starting quickly, though, this is a project that really began life as an ADA project at the port of Cachere. It's something that as with many projects, it has expanded, and it's taken on a bit of a life of its own, as things tend to. Um, but I think it's all for the good. Um, the goal is to improve the presence of Napa Valley uh, Hotel, the street press presence. Today, it's, it's behind um, a row of Italian cypress. Right there at the intersection, there's r really very little um, that says welcome um, and I think that the goal here is to try to improve that, that street frontage, not, o not only right at the intersection, but to also take it all the way along the length of, of Madison Street and then also along Wash Washington Street. The idea being um, taking a little piece of the stone, uh, breaking that down into less of a mass as we move along uh, Madison Street into some pilasters. Uh, worked into the existing hedges that that's really do a great job screening the parking lot. And the last thing we want to do is open up the views into the parking. But we do want to just expand the, the presence all the way from um, the, the, fr the first exit drive along Madison all the way to the intersection. And we're doing that with the stone pilasters and also with uh, stone aprons on the, on the drive lane. Um, the 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 walls at the at the entrance are really uh, as has been touched on a little bit are in response to the the intersection and the activity that's going on at the intersection there. We're really trying to create it's you know it's the entrance the portico share to the to a lobby to a hotel, and the last thing we want is a lot of uh, intersection vehicle headlights as they're making that turn will be coming right into that space. But it's also a way we can bring a little bit of a sense of identity for the Napa Valley Lodge, a little closer out to the street frontage, which today uh, it's really buried behind not only the hedges, but also um, the Italian cypress around the, around the fountain. Um, it allows us to place um, a Napa Valley Lodge identity sign, which really is going to be uh, very neutral tones. Um, understated yet elegant, as is the, the stonework, and really the, the whole concept behind the improvements. But at the end of the day, the improvements are really landscaping and site improvements. It's not a, it's not a big project. It's not really an ambitious project. Um, so there are, some, there are some issues with some of the conditions on the project, and I, I really would urge council to, to reconsider um, some of the conditions. Um, I think the, the lot line adjustment is fairly straightforward. I think it's in everybody's best interest to get the property lines cleaned up. It's property that the Napa Valley Lodge has been maintaining for the last 35 years. They've, been, um, they've really taken ownership of that land for many years um, and been responsible for the upkeep of it, for the maintenance of it. So I think that it's, it's, it, makes, it makes a lot of sense to go ahead 
um, and impl implement the lot line adjustment. But obviously, there's there's considerable expense involved with that for the for the applicant, and it's expense that wasn't factored in um, to initial budgeting for this project. Um, again, with the sidewalk, uh, there were some comments earlier about about sidewalks on top of drain lines. Again, the sidewalk along Washington is actually a sidewalk that the town of Yontville is conditioning on the project. It's a, it's a sidewalk that the town uh, would like to install. I can see the, the purpose of it to increase access into, the, into Yontville Park makes, makes a lot of sense. Um, but really from the, from the project side, it's the sidewalk on the Washington frontage that is equally important to us. Um, as that is the logical progression from guests for guests from the lobby into into town, um, and creating an ADA accessible uh, connection there is very important. Um, the 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 condition regarding the regarding the drainage improvements is really the one that we we're having at the hardest time coming to terms with, and I could understand it a little more if we were. If we were building a new building, if we were remodeling, if we were adding square footage, if we were changing drainage patterns, if we were adding to impervious surfaces, um, and doing things which alter drainage. But really, at the end of the day, all we're doing are some very simple site improvements, some very simple landscape improvements, and it seems it seems like an unfair burden um, to add that to the cost of the project. Um, for the for the for the hotel, um, as you were expressing earlier, is it in is it in the town of Yontville's Bill's budget? Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. But a job was never in the in the budget for for our project either. So it's something that um, definitely definitely um, takes on kind of a life of its own. And I would urge you to to reconsider that as a condition on the project. Um, maybe it's something to where the where the applicant, uh, you know, it's it's written in there at the moment where the applicant uh, would under, would under, um, would take take on the the design and the engineer and the design and the engineering for the project, but it's it's really hard for us to engineer a project that we really don't know what we're trying to engineer for. We don't know what the what the drainage issues are. We don't know why that's something that we would have to be encumbered with. Um, uh, in addition to the to the cost, the cost of the of the drainage improvements. Um, but again, just to just to recap quickly, it is a it is a very simple project. We're trying to increase and upgrade the the presence of the hotel for the uh, for the guests, but also for the town of the town of Yontville. Thanks. Thanks. Are there questions of Mr. Phillips? I do, uh, if no other council questions, I do have a question related to that last piece because I want to make sure I understand your position and as it's uh, representing the applicant that um, you're okay with all the conditions that are being presented in the staff report except for the those related to the, the relocation of the storm drain. Is that a fair statement? Right. And you feel that the storm drain re relocation in and of itself, you're not necessarily objecting to, but it's how much of that portion of this the applicant is being asked to pay for, basically. Right. So right. if you were to, if, if we were to say we agree with you, it's an unfair burden on the applicant, then would you be able to identify the value the town receives for basically giving you that stretch of Washington Street to build your required sidewalk. I'm kind of sensing that the, that's the trade. Is well, that it's, that's not really even the trade because that piece of sidewalk is sidewalk that the town of Yontville is requesting. It's uh, but not you know, the portion I'm talking about is further up Washington Street. If I understood your <clears throat> comments correctly, you mentioned that's the type of that's the area that you need for ADA accessibility, and you want your guests to be able to get to and from Washington Street. Maybe I misheard you. Yeah, really it's the, it's the sidewalk along Madison Street um, coming out of the, the Port of Cachere area that will provide the guest ADA access into town. 
The sidewalk along Washington is what is being conditioned by uh, Public Works. And it's at, we've actually extended it from what the original Public Works plan showed um, to get a better crosswalk into the, into the, um, the park. It was, originally it was at a really awkward <coughs> angle um, across the road. So we've looked at, right, there's the original uh, crossing point into the park. We've looked at pushing it following the um, Zoning and Design Review Board hearing. We've pushed it further to the north along Washington. But looking at the uh, overhead site map, I'll call it, that shows the uh, proposed property adjustment, that one there, the entire length of that orange property line adjustment, are you saying you don't care if that happens or not? Or are you saying that that's part of your required ADA accessibility of the property? No, that's not part of our ADA. And, you, and really, if that happens or not, it, it, it really is somewhat of a moot point. Um, the, the idea with the, with the property lines is just to try to clean it up, um, because right now there's improvements that cross, cross the property line. I need to clarify that statement because I do want to point out that there are some, while we, we support and want to clean up the property line, a lot of the proposed project is actually occurring and requires the existing town public right-of-way and the town council has to consent to the use of the public right-of-way. And typically, even in a case like that, that would result in the sale of the property because the benefit is going to the property owner. And what we thought was appropriate here in some case was that the consideration uh, because the, the pr project came in and proposed sidewalks. So the concern we had is, you know, being proactive. If we're putting sidewalk on top of something that needs to be worked on, we have an issue. But a, a number of the project elements, including the pile asters, you know, they would have, right now they are proposed to go in the public right away that's owned by the town. So I think there is, uh, while we're sensitive to the applicant's consideration about the cost, there's also a, a fair amount of uh, consideration on the part of the town in terms of what we're, we're giving to the applicant in the terms of the property. Now, I would also say if the, the reason the town proposed that the applicant, that we would contribute 50% of the project cost um, we stand behind that, and project costs include design costs, and um, we would be more than willing to continue to work with them, but the bottom line is they're going to put stuff in the public right-of-way in that easement that's going to benefit them, and ultimately I don't want to spend our money and come back two years later and have to tear all that out and put it in. So if we're going to do this, we, we need to resolve it, or we can put the uh, deferred submittal and... Uh, but that's not going to allow them their, their, their project completion because we wouldn't allow, I, I, wouldn't, I would not recommend allowing anything be built in the area that we're going to be subject to that potential project. Okay. And that's why we're trying to work with them because we do see most, I mean, I have to be very honest, this is a very positive project. And I do understand where they're at in the sense that there's a, a lot of little issues um, and I'm sure from the landscape architect's perspective, he never started by looking at what was on the public right-of-way <coughs> versus what was assumed to be the property of the lodge. Well, I, okay. would, I, would, I, I think we were all surprised when we look, first looked at the survey and we started seeing that there was, you know, there was a big discrepancy about where people assumed the property line was to where it really is. And work ha has been permitted and approved um, off the property line. And today, again, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a landscape zone that the hotel has maintained and has taken care of for, for many years. So I don't see there being a big change, really. It's just removing a line. Uh, really, though, the maintenance is going to stay with the, obviously stay with the hotel. So there's not really a, a big change there. Um, mm -hmm. The other thing that I would well, like before to... Before we go on to change subject, I just want to point out to the mayor and the council mm -hmm. where the two right-of-way lines are. So the existing right-of-way... Uh, Washington Street is this double dash, long dash line. And that line comes around through where the this is where the statue is, a landscaping area, and then it runs along uh, Madison. So the proposed line is the orange. So the area in between the orange and the the existing right of way line is what we're talking about. So that there are improvements. There's a stone wall. There's the the grass area and stuff like that. And so so that's the difference that we're talking about is what improvements are currently in 
the town right away and what the proposed orange right away line is. And I'll ask either of you then, because this is a continuation of my question, on Madison Street where the multiple uh, pilasters are, are proposed, is that uh, proposed to be the same sidewalk the, that we are talking about on Washington Street? Right, it would all, it would all match. The only difference we were um, looking at was the width. Um, originally we had proposed it all at 48 inches and there was some confusion earlier. After the ZDRB hearing, they suggested going to five feet along Washington because they were concerned about the proximity to the wall. Um, I'm, I'm speaking more specifically about the Madison stretch to the south of the property where it appears there are pilasters, not, not this map. If, that's that's so the, the sidewalk. My question is further west of that, where all those other pilasters are, that is in what? That's not a pedestrian? It's, it's existing town right away because the, the black line is the existing right away. So these are within the existing town right away. Understood. But that's not sidewalk. But not be sidewalk. And there. no sidewalk. So proposed. those are just cosmetic pilasters to line the edge of the yeah, uh, real, uh, somebody's property line. In this area, this There's a hedge. The hedge. They'll be Correct. within the hedge. Okay. You, there, there isn't any development, obviously, beyond this property. So extending a sidewalk beyond um, the hotel entry really doesn't. No. doesn't benefit any, anything. No, I would agree with that. Okay. But, but I guess to go back again to the, the sidewalk and the drain along Washington, it's, it's neither of those are improvements that, that the hotel would like to see happen. They're improvements that we've incorporated into the plans because it was requested by the town of Yontville. Right. And, and I think if I may head off before the town manager speaks again about this, I get back to the point I made a moment ago. It appears that instead of paying for the land from the town, it's basically a trade of this square footage that becomes sidewalk so that you could do what you want to do on your property. And we're basically gifting the, the public land of that sidewalk area to the property owner. Right. Again, and that's no. the value where, okay, we're going to do that then we're going to also say let's partner on the drainage thing. But how is that a change from the condition that exists today? It's public land that you want to put your sidewalk on and it, public land that... No, it's, it's, public work, it's public land that we're putting a sidewalk on that the town is requesting and it's land that we have always, or the applicant has always maintained. Right, so, so just to clarify, the right-of-way proposed would be at the back of the sidewalk. Right. The existing right away pretty much cuts through what's existing landscaping and proposed landscaping. Right. So we talk about a dedication of an area between the existing and the proposed. So the the town right away, the sidewalk would still be in the town right away. Understood. But I, if I want to make sure I understand your your reasoning for not feeling obliged to go along with the drainage portion is because it already. It, this is an error in property line. It, the fountain area should have never been built where it is. People back then on both sides of the deal had the lines wrong. Right. So we now know that. There doesn't seem to be any discrepancy about that. The question is, do we leave that error in place and just say, you know, because it's been there, we ignore the fact that it's wrong, or do we, what I think the town is doing, uh, and you're doing as well is trying to find a compromise of how do we fix it the best we can. Right. Is and that a fair assessment? That's a fair assessment. And in our mind, the, the, the financial contribution from the applicant is the cost of the sidewalk, the cost of the crosswalk, and the cost of the, the legal and, <coughs> and engineering work involved in the lot line adjustment. And you just feel that that's, that's overly burdensome given the given, condition? Give, well, given the scope of the project. I could see if we were coming in and we were building a new building or remodeling or adding or changing drainage patterns, but really this is a very simple, very small budget landscape and hardscape uh, improvement project. And it just seems like it's an unreasonable uh, condition to place on such a project. Okay. Well, I appreciate you talking it through. I, I don't think I'm the only one that had some questions about that, so hopefully that's been clarified oh, for folks. Me. Yeah, Councilmember Dornbecker. I do have a question that I'd like clarified. Um, this gentleman, the landscape architect, is saying that 
that uh, then we would be requiring the lodge to be in charge of design and um, execution for that drainage project. Is that true? What we have attempted to do is, you know, there's civil work that they need to do, and I think we can certainly provide assistance. But in order to ensure that the project can go forward in the time frame that they want, if, if we defer the project until we do the storm drain, then they have to wait and do the project. So that's why the town felt that it was appropriate to commit to a 50% cost share. Um, and I, I do need to point out that the normal development standards, the sidewalks are normal condition, and, and they're changing that, and the, the approaches uh, they're bringing, and you know, certainly neither party looked at it, but we can't continue to allow the use of the public right away and, and not try to attempt to resolve that. And there is a significant benefit to the to private property owner for the property consideration. And I don't know if I completely answered your question. Well, uh, no, my question is, who is going to have control over the design and execution for a drainage project in our town? First of all, that's under the purview of the town engineer. And I do want to make sure that people understand, this is not, and I'm not going to pretend to be an engineer, this is not an overly sophisticated situation. We have an existing storm drain, and the attempt is to replace in the same alignment with a slightly deeper, slightly larger pipe capacity. So we're not talking rocket science with no due disrespect to rocket scientists. This is a relatively straightforward, not not a lot of significant work. And some of the work has already been done by R&D Kitchen, some of the design work. So now it's just a matter of putting together the, the plans for the contractor to go build the storm drain. And that's the, des the amount of design work that we're talking about. So it's not, not a lot of uh, design work. So and, I, and I would offer that if that was something that the council felt should be on the town, we would be happy to take that burden on to make sure that it's done. Well, I think it, once we get to that point, we're going to need to get some clarity about what that 50 50 <coughs> or whatever percentage commitment is. So if you want to address that now or after we hear public comment, that's fine. You're, you're dealing with, um, we're dealing with a cost estimate adjusted for a segment of work taken out from a previous um, uh, construction engineer's estimate. We're talking about a project in a forty-five to 55000 value total. So approximately half would be twenty-five or so thousand dollars. I think to Councilor Dornbecker's question, if hopefully I'll paraphrase it correctly, um, why are we asking them to do the design and engineering of that piece? It's a public works uh, item actually, project, right. if you would. So is it you basically just want them to pay the money and the town engineer is handling the project? Not necessarily. That's not a – the town engineer is responsible for the approval and review of the design work. In many cases, for example, I'll use the enhancements across the, the way to the Hillstone development. The town engineer will review – the various designs for the sidewalks, the storm drain, the water connection, sign off on the work done by a third-party civil engineer firm. So that is, and that's typical, the same way you earlier approved tonight the, the acceptance of the public work improvements for the Vineyard Oaks neighborhood. Uh, again, that was not a situation where the town designed all of the work for the items that would come into the town system, including the water, the storm drain, we reviewed it to ensure that the work that's proposed meets the standards and the town engineer and our public works inspector and our building inspector review that. So it's not uncommon that there is design work that's a condition of the uh, the same way we often put conditions, for example, for a grease interceptor. That's the responsibility of the restaurant and the property owner to ultimately design it in the interface we do review it and sign off on it. So I hope that's adding some clarification to your question. Yes, thank you. Any other questions of Mr. Phillips at there, this time? There, there, there yeah. is just one, one last point that I would like to make regarding this. I know we're kind of beating it up here. But the, the town did provide us with the plans that had been pro provided earlier this year for the sidewalk improvements. And on that plan, I just do want to note for the record that this drain line wasn't in consideration to be upsized changed at that time. So it seems like it's something that's come online uh, after the fact that another another party became involved in, in this project. I'd like to address, because we've explained that to the applicant, and I think there's a mischaracterization. 
our we have been working on the planning and the, uh, the, the phase and its concept planning for the Yountville bike path. So we would provided that. And as we get further moving, that's a project that's still in the final design and movement forward phase. The storm drain would have come up um, in the fact that we sent them over. We provided them copies of the work that the town has been conceptually doing to expedite so that they could review it. I just think that statement's taking that a little out of a characterization and there are layers. I do know and respect the fact that it's a concern. Uh, we understand that and, and that's why the town believes that we do have, you know, we're responsible for drainage on uh, a portion of the property. And I do need to point out that their property does drain onto and into that storm drain. So it's not something that does not have a benefit to their project and the construction of the sidewalk and the continuation of the improvements in the landscape burn is a changed drainage condition in that area. Thank you. I, I think we're ready for other public comment. I appreciate people's uh, patience as we work through this, but uh, I would invite any other members of the public that might have questions or comments about this project to come forward now. Anyone is welcome. Comments, questions? <coughs> Troop, anything? No? Okay. Uh, seeing no other public comment, I will close the public hearing and return the discussion to council for potential action. If we need further clarification from staff, uh, we can certainly include that in our discussion. So uh, just to remind folks, uh, the council in particular, the two exceptions uh, that are findings that we are going to be addressing, need to address uh, the freestanding signage, um, the two pilasters in particular on either side of the port of and the height of the interior stone wall being eight feet uh, higher than the um, the uh, primarily residential code of six feet. And then there's also the applicant's uh, request that we consider um, <coughs> reducing or eliminating the um, drainage uh, component of their responsibility to this project. So with that, Councilmember Muller, are you prepared? I am ready. Um, First, I would like to say that um, I am okay with the proposed width of the sidewalk on Madison at four feet and on Washington at five feet because that was a condition put on by the ZDRB. I just want to make it clear that I'm okay with that too. Also, oh, sorry, I want to just make sure I got that and staff did too that you're basically, ZDRB's recommendation was to go to five feet everywhere, but you're saying you were fine with the four feet, five feet. The, the the project as it's proposed to us tonight is five feet on all the sidewalks. No, it's four foot on Madison, and so the ZDRB's concern was with the sidewalk on Madison because it provides access to the park. It's beyond just the hotel, whereas the Madison Street sidewalk is really just guest access to the, the hotel. The sidewalk on Washington, Washington so, too provides access to the park. Right, right. Yeah. I'm, so, so I guess I must have been misunderstanding. So this, the four, short portion of Madison, Madison. Is four how foot. wide? Four feet. Four feet. Four feet. And all four the rest feet. of it five. on Washington is five, Correct. as proposed. The applicant has proposed that. The ZDRB has recommended that. And staff supports that. Well, we, in the staff report, I did raise a question about a couple of things that came out of the uh, ZDRB. Was one concern was this wall used to go right against the sidewalk, mm -hmm. and now it's been. What? What? been pulled yeah it used to go right adjacent to the sidewalk and it's been since pulled back right. and also uh, there was a mistaken concept that five feet is required to meet ADA it is not uh, ADA and CalDAG requires a four-foot sidewalk to face a curb so uh, and the other couple of considerations was right now this is a very uh, rural quality at that corner, unimproved, informal, and it's going to a very formal condition of paved. And this is a low traffic, um, typically on Washington, from the park. So the necessity for a, a wider sidewalk that we would want, say, down Washington further, where there's a lot of pedestrian traffic, may not uh, bear on that section there. Um, plus, the most of the traffic is coming out of the hotel will be 
coming down here and then over to the corner and then headed south. And Councilman Moa, you're you're saying that you're <coughs> fine with the four foot Madison stretch right. <coughs> and you support the five foot all along Washington. Correct. So Thank I want you. to be clear that that's my position on that. Uh, my position is also in agreement with the crosswalk extending further north as proposed. Um, I am okay with the trade of the, uh, the right-of-way in lieu of the public works improvements. Um, when this was originally done, Yonville was very different than it is today and what it's going to be in the next few years when we get these projects done. Um, even though, you know, increasing, I don't think anyone's really brought up the issue that uh, they have a problem with increasing that, that drainage. It's going to be important. As much as all the engineers like to plan and everything, sometimes water really has a mind of its own, and we're doing a lot of new improvement here, and we've really got to get that water down some big hole. So I, to me, this is an important uh, thing that we must do, sharing these costs. Um, I, I am in support of that. Um, <clears throat> and I'm actually going to spend some time talking about the height of the wall. Uh, I know we've talked a lot about the drainage, so now here comes the wall. First, I'd really like to thank uh, ZDRB for their very thoughtful comments. And I am very supportive and in agreement, which I think what their intent is, was not to set up conditions where we're going to allow a variance here that's going to, you know, start affecting things in different areas of town and, and all that. So um, <coughs> I am okay with the height of that wall, and I recognize because of what the CDRB has said about not wanting to change our municipal code six foot with a two foot extension, that <coughs> it's critically important to really specify uh, findings. I know there, you've got some in this report, but I'd really like to see them brought out very clearly so there isn't any unintended consequences when a, some residential property now wants to create an eight foot wall and using this as a precedent. So the most important finding that I think is going to really set us apart there is to say that this eight foot three inch wall is very important because it provides noise attenuation from heavy traffic and heavy traffic volume that is very particular to this intersection of Washington and Madison. Uh, in addition, I think a finding that we can make is that this wall, unlike a wall or a fence on a property line in a residential area, is recessed back four feet. The walls that we talk about uh, in uh, the residences are on the property line. And because it's recessed back on this um, property line, I think that it establishes a, a different massing effect that is critical and kind of unique to what this property uh, wants to do. Um, third, I think we should note in the findings that we are actually decreasing from the taller height of the cypress trees to a lower height. I know you've got this in there, but I think calling it out and making it, as I said before, a list of findings is important because these cypress trees really cause visual impairment, and by having a lower eight-foot wall, we are uh, really going to improve our, our scenic resources that are consistent with the general plan. So I think that that's... Um, I, and, I, and I think that, you know, these findings and the other ones that you've made are really is, is substantial evidence to support uh, a variation for this wall from this wall height from our municipal code. And it's really just not, you know, an argument. So I think we have to make that distinction, too, to really kind of set us up so we don't really have something come back to us in the future saying, well, you let that happen. And then finally, I would like to say that in addition to the findings, if we do agree on the wall height, assuming that that does happen, that it might be important to put in as a um, condition of approval that we, say, we specifically state 
that they need to build the lower wall with its height and length and the taller wall with its height and length um, so that we recognize that there is a special land consideration and this is going to have mitigation on the noise by doing that and it will <coughs> by doing that it's going to allow us to, to defend if we ever had to that this wasn't just a special property consideration for this property owner that it really is um, kind of a unique and important consideration considering the special configurations of this property and that maybe we could even add that the both walls the color and the fab and the stonework match or, or whatever is going to give us th the needed teeth if you will to defend this against any kind of request for now we want walls all over town Yonville that are eight feet Thank you, Councilmember Hall. I'll see if I can follow that. Um, uh, all good points. Uh, I'll, I'll just address um, directly the, the pieces that were asked for, and then make a couple comments. Um, I'm fine with the wall at the uh, at, as it's presented here. I believe it's eight foot three inches. Um, I, I think it accomplishes, um, and more so than what the existing Cypress uh, are doing, and, and I'm I'm okay with that. Uh, and I recognize the differences between this commercial property and residential and, and why the wall would be of a different height, um, being a solid wall. And I'm relatively familiar with this subject on the residential side at this juncture. So um, I'm okay with it. I think it makes sense and it, it does uh, hopefully accomplish what the, uh, what the property owner is, is trying to do with regards to their business. Um, I'm also, um, I believe the other item we were to talk about was uh, the signage. I'm comfortable with the signage. I recognize there's not a specific call out for um, this type of signage, but that we've, um, in a sense, found a proxy for that in boxing the, uh, the language or the, whatever the signage is to, to do the, um, the valuation of what it is, and it appears to conform and be within what we would allow. Um, so I'm comfortable with that. To the to the two points um, with regards to, and I'll start with the crosswalk. Um, I'm a frequenter of this park. I think most people in town have at least tried to cross there from one time or another, and adding a sidewalk um, and a crosswalk in a currently awkward location in town will be an enormous benefit to the residents of this community. So I applaud everyone for coming together on that. Um, on the storm drain, which uh, there's no such thing as a free lunch. And regardless of mistakes that were made in the past with regards to property lines, we all have to recognize that they exist. And the town, I think, is being very generous, although I don't know the exact square footage that we will be giving up in a lot line adjustment. There's probably some relative value to that, and I would argue that real estate in Yauntville has held its value, um, and maybe even more so in the commercial side, um, in light of the number of other um, supporting restaurants and cast of businesses that we have here, and I think it is a great benefit to the property owner to be able to have um, this project completed and allow us to uh, grant, if you will, that lot line adjustment. In return for, um, and I will use Steve's math, of approximately 50% to $55,000, not to be uh, misconstrued, that seems like a very reasonable price for what will be a fantastic project in addition to the north end of town. Um, I think it will bring that element of uh, finished, polished look to the Napa Valley Lodge, and um, I know that it is gets a significant amount of traffic past that intersection um, based on the diagrams that I see, and I'm not artistic, but whoever did it does make it very appealing and approachable to me, and I trust the property owner will greatly benefit from that and the new store drain that they'll support us um, in developing. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Dornbecker. Um, I concur with my um, council um, um, partners and um, I think that the um, the wall being eight feet three inches tall with the signage I think is a, the a line of sight that is coming from you know that particular um, area is going to be very helpful for the lodge so I'm glad to see that I'm happy with the signage I'm happy with the the um, height of the wall. I do also support that um, in 
you know, in fairness, that you share the cost of the storm drain um, because of the lot line adjustment. When I saw how much it's going to be adjusted, and with the value of land in this town, it's only going to imp improve in value. So I think it's a fair trade, and I welcome your project, and I think it's going to be a lovely addition to the north of town. Thank you. And you're okay with the uh, signage, did you say? Absolutely. Okay. Thanks very much. Um, I agree. Uh, I think uh, Councilmember Hall really shared most of my uh, opinion on this. Uh, I'm, I'm fine with the freestanding signage as presented. Uh, I think it's totally appropriate to measure the signage as staff and the applicant have done. Um, I am also fine with the uh, eight foot, three inch wall height, especially given the landscaping component. It minimizes the impact of that wall. Uh, I think it's also only fair to the property owner that we not require excessive elimination of the screening that's needed for that site. We have to acknowledge that it is a major intersection in town and uh, it would be un inappropriate, I think, for us to remove the primarily the, the uh, light screenage, I think, is the most significant issue. But it's also a bit of a privacy issue for uh, their lobby area and their guests. Um, I support the um, town's plan for the partnership on the, on the drainage uh, public works improvements. Uh, I do feel like it's, a, it's an appropriate uh, trade for the uh, extension of the property line to include the uh, existing town property so there can be a, a more appropriate sidewalk area. As the applicant's representative stated, uh, they have some ADA accessibility issues that are being addressed. There, um, I think there have been some gives and takes on both sides for this project. I think it is a very uh, elegant and attractive project, as, as other council members have stated. I think it's going to be a really nice improvement, as well as a very practical improvement based on the need to really identify the property. We've seen that elsewhere in town where sometimes it's hard. Even we all know about where Napa Valley Lodge is, but not every guest does. So I think there are some very common sense uh, upgrades being made. So I would propose, uh, I would support the uh, proposal as staff has presented it. I do not feel the need to add an additional condition that, that uh, kind of reinforces what I think is already clearly stated by staff in the report that uh, this is not a precedent setting uh, finding. This is specific to this set of circumstances that this does not mean residential property conditions change. It does not mean every other commercial property has the right to change. We have the authority to make an exception where we feel the site conditions warrant that exception. I would support making that finding in this case. Uh, it doesn't mean that we're going to do it in all other cases. So uh, those are my comments. Uh, with that, is there a motion to be had um, as it relates to this application? I make a motion that we approve resolution number 3004-11, approving the master development plan amendment and sign permit for Napa Valley Lodge located at 2230 Madison Avenue, APN 03602003. Second. And before I ask for a vote, does staff have all the information you need from us in terms of all the elements, findings, and everything? You're good? Okay. With that, uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 And no opposition. So thank you. Congratulations on the application being um, granted. And look forward to working cooperatively to make it all work out. So thank you very much. And with that, I'll invite Vice Mayor Chilton to return to the dais. Hopefully he's within earshot. And he is. We are going to move on to our uh, agenda item 12, administrative regular items. The first one being a discussion related to community cleanup day options. Do we have a staff report, please? Uh, yes, uh, Mayor Council. Um, we're here today as a follow-up to ongoing discussions related to community cleanup. Um, 
In the audience today are also representatives of Upper Valley Disposal and representatives uh, from Environmental County, uh, Napa County Environmental Management, Steve Letterer. But um, this is part of an ongoing dialogue that the council had asked staff and our representative to Upper Valley Authority um, to work on with regards to community cleanup. Uh, short history, as you know, there was, with the last franchise adjustment, a $25,000 grant provided to the town um, that has funded past uh, community cleanups, and recently, this spring, the fund balance of $3,779 was not sufficient to maintain the level of community cleanup that we have historically done uh, recently, I should point out. Um, so the council asked us to do that. I do want to point out one clarification. Council has provided uh, 7,500 as a set aside in the community promotions budget. It was not specifically allocated, but it was identified as potentially being available should you find an alternative program uh, related to community cleanup that you wanted to participate in. So in the fiscal analysis, I had talked about the fact that it wasn't budgeted and there, there is a, a placeholder. Um, discussion points. Um, it's important to note that um, we are part of a partnership for franchising uh, garbage and recycling services. And that includes the unincorporated County of Napa, City of Calistoga, City of St. Helena, and the Town of Yonville and what is the Upper Valley uh, Authority and that provides franchise oversight for garbage collection and the rates for that area. and. Uh, Upper Valley Disposal is the um, franchisee. Um, when we look at the discussion points, I also want to point out the town pays for garbage. So we're, we're, we're not the provider of the garbage service, um, and we are a customer of both the, uh, the agency and Upper Valley Disposals. Um, Garbage and recycling services, and I use the term collectively because they are, that is the service. It's not just garbage going away. It's also the recycling that's been expanded upon. Um, and all of that is paid for under the rates that are provided. Um, garbage and recycling services is not mandatory in the town of Yonville. There are a number of communities where that is. That's not the case here. As a result, some property owners do not contract with Upper Valley Disposal and we're not 100% sure of how they remove their garbage. I have a few choices that I can provide. But that just gives you a little background. Um, in the staff report, Upper Valley has also provided a history in some of the years past of, of the event. And I will just share with you that the event grew out of a, uh, at one point in time in its history, it was a debris box that people came to centrally and threw stuff in. and it had actually developed to a period of time where there was actually two, two events a year in the early 2000. Uh, that's not been the case in the most recent years. It's been a one time a year. I will point out we have a very high quality of service. The community cleanup day is a curbside. You bring it to the curb, it goes away. Uh, it's a Cadillac event and it has a, a relatively high cost of between eight to $10,000 a year based on the current disposal rates. So we looked at evaluating what are some different alternatives. Um, one is to continue the current program, uh, adjust uh, what the price will be. Um, but we do have a footnote that one modification we would need to make to that program would be that Upper Valley Disposal would only pick up from the rate payers, which means that if there was somebody that was not a customer they shouldn't be picking up. Now that would require a little coordination on the part of Upper Valley, but uh, that's consistent with the provision to Proposition 26. We could look at a return to an annualized um, centralized drop box. That could be one spot or two spots around town. Um, Upper Valley has estimated that that type of event would cost us between 3,500 and 4,000, again, based on volume. There's also an additional cost that the town would bear where they would request that we would provide some type of staff monitoring to ensure that inappropriate material hazardous waste are not dumped into the debris box. Um, so that's another method. It's a less costly. It does require that the resident customer bring 
their garbage to the centralized spot, so it's not quite the high-end level of service. Um, there's also the possibility of a coupon or voucher for free pickup. Uh, currently, Upper Valley has a special pickup or a bulky pickup, so this would sort of be something that could be provided, and then the customer would schedule it, use it. Um, the town and Upper Valley have had some discussions about whether that price should look more like the bulky special item pickup or a $150 special pickup, but there is concepts and there are other areas that have a, a coupon or voucher. And again, uh, another alternative is certainly no program. Uh, again, people are responsible for uh, ultimately for the removal of their garbage and waste. Um, Options include self-haul to local disposal sites, <coughs> donation to local charities, expending, uh, depending on the nature of the waste or schedule. And they also have the option of using the, the bulky pickup item or the special pickup that Upper Valley provides for right now. Second part of the policy discussion really comes down to how do we pay for it. Um, as we indicated right now, it's provided under a grant provided through the ratepayers uh, from the Upper Valley franchise. So that $25,000 grant is part of that. Um, we could continue with an annual ratepayer surcharge. Um, that's estimated to cost between $0.60 cents and $1.15 a month, depending on the program. And that would approximately be $7.20 to almost $14. Uh, this would require that the council provide uh, resolution and direction and its representative council member Moeller would then represent to Upper Valley JPA that the town would prefer an add-on to the approved rate or a surcharge in this case to fund the program whatever level that program might be we also have an option of establishing a franchise fee currently the town does not collect a franchise fee from Upper Valley uh, city of Calistoga has a six percent franchise fees and those funds come in Again, a franchise fee would potentially be able to be a legitimate cost a recovery to pay for an event such as this and also potentially for street and road improvements. A, a finding would necessarily be need to made, but those could be. Again, I'm just saying here these are more policy discussions for you, but those are some different funding alternatives. Um, the last option is that the town provide a contribution from the general fund. Again, I do want to point out that the town general fund, you would be subsidizing what is in essence a ratepayer operation, not necessarily a town fund, but certainly that would be the option of the town. And in fact, there was a, a period in, of a couple years in 2005 era where the town did, although I can't find clear language in the budget, but the town did fund it between the last grant cycle and the current cycle. So the town seeks feedback and direction on several different policy questions. The first question is, does the town council want some type of community cleanup event to utilize the remaining grant fund balance? A second and related question to that would be, does it want to continue a different or a new kind of community cleanup program going forward? And then the third question relates to the funding, how nature of event and then which of the funding mechanisms might the council be interested and again you could apply that question both to if that's for example if you're looking at yes we want a community cleanup project to utilize the remaining balance and we will offset the one year and then going forward we want x type of community involvement we don't want to use general fund we want to support one of these or some combination thereof so i'm trying to make it clear but you've got two different options with very similar approaches. Um, with that, um, based on the feedback and direction provided by the town council, town staff and the uh, JPA representative would work with the um, Upper Valley Agency staff and representatives of Upper Valley to implement that desired outcome. Thank you. Does the council have any questions of the staff report? I just, Mo, or, uh, Dorn Becker? I just have one, and that is that uh, under the option of coupon or voucher for free pickup, the staff report says that the Upper Valley has advised the town that they thought that they are not able to offer such a program. 
Um, I would say since that time, while it's still there, there is cost considerations, Upper Valley has indicated that they're really not set up to manage a coupon. If we really wanted to go that route, they would work with us, but they have initially identified to us a cost of 150 per special pickup or coupon used. So if you issued 800 coupons, you can do the math. So that, that might be a little bit more expensive than we've been than anticipated. Um, we don't have, you know, one of the things that we've tried to understand is do we have 100, 200, 300 people using the service? And we just don't have, in all honesty, we just don't have solid empirical numbers. Um, we have volume. The, the garbage company has great records on what the total volume we picked up and where it was disposed, but we don't know, like I say, are we dealing with 100 people, 200, 300? So that makes, that, that would be one of the concerns. And, and I think if you did have an interest and that was your direction today, I'm sure Upper Valley would work with us and probably there, there's probably a different price point that we might be able to reach and understanding how that, but in that documentation you see that that was what they've initially identified. Any question, uh, Councilmember Hall? Yes, I'm formulating a question, um, or maybe several. First one is, do we? Because I, I I read the report, I understand kind of the basis of all this. I know sort of my mindset around what I think I want to ask, but I don't know if it's information we're allowed to have. Do we know how many or what the what the income is from Upper Valley Waste Management for the residents in the community of Yonville? Do we know or can we get access to that information? And I'm sorry if you told me and I don't know it. I, I'm going to defer some of that to the representatives from Upper Valley. Uh, what I will tell you is the revenue stream for the rates that they're based on are tied to the, the rate structure that the JPA approves. Mm -hmm. So from that standpoint, all of the revenue that comes into is tied into that formula. Uh, the county staff evaluates the cost of formula and then applies the, the guaranteed rate of return and then that sets the, the menu of rates and charges. So okay. from that standpoint, and, and Upper Valley staff would be more capable, the, the rates that they're charging us are consistent with that rate structure. Mm -hmm. So the short answer is we don't necessarily know what the income level that they generate from the residents of this community are. I don't have that information right. readily available. Okay. I don't know if that's been tracked that and, way and or I, if it's tracked. I'm just trying to, in my head, sort of sort through all these options and everything else, and, and that would seem to me to be an important piece of information. Um, and, and I don't know uh, how qualified we are or uh, what our rights to that information would be. Um, it seems to me this is somewhat operated like a utility. Um, that we do have the option of getting out of, but I would be interested in maybe knowing that information and if it was available uh, to be able to help formulate my thoughts around how we might proceed with this. But if we don't have it, then I'll, I'll hold the rest of my questions until maybe I hear some of the outside parties. Councilmember Muller, uh, as our representative, did you want to add anything at this time or have any questions of uh, the staff report? Uh, I have some. Microphone, please. Let's just do questions of the staff report as presented right now. Okay, Vice Mayor. I have one question. How many how many customers are there in Yonville? Do you know what the, how many people in Yonville are? How many bills are there? Maybe they can answer that. But slightly, we have a at our count. They they show somewhere, and I'm sure they can tell us somewhere in the mid 700s and we show about 800 water accounts. So okay. we do know that there are definitely properties that, as I indicated, do not have service. But it's mo it certainly is most households. Oh, yes. We are obviously majority do have service. Okay. Thank you. That's my only question. Okay. Um, I'm going to hold any questions until after we potentially hear from uh, our representatives from Upper Valley Disposal uh, or the county. So with that, I'll invite uh, um, open this public hearing portion of this non-public hearing and and welcome if if you have anything to add to the situation yes I'm appreciate you coming here to help 
discuss our situation. And you might need to Pastone. you might need to lower that microphone just a little bit, Bob. Thank you, Bob Pastoni, and my daughter Christy, over there. And um, we've been uh, servicing the town of Yonville since 1963. A lot of changes certainly has uh, come about in uh, uh, in the collection and how we collect. And uh, the council peoples that we've dealt with because of their changing times and, and uh, requirements, state requirements of how we do business and how we perform the services. And uh, uh, we've always, uh, uh, should I say, uh, since uh, in the 80s, uh, it was uh, time for cleanup of Yonville. And they asked us to bring in debris boxes to help do the cleanup. And um, that was uh, uh, fairly successful, but uh, we found that uh, there were uh, a lot of material coming from the outside. Uh, there were uh, incidents uh, that uh, came about where people loaded material to one side, and uh, we had trouble getting the boxes on the truck. and and almost tipping the truck over, and, and, and these kind of things. Um, hazardous waste came about in those early periods, and, and the early periods we didn't think a lot about it. People brought their stuff and we threw it in and there wasn't a lot of uh, as much concerns and and, and things as it is today. And, and uh, it was brought by the council that they wanted a, a pickup at the houses, at the residence. And they put together a project, I call it a project, because it wasn't only a cleanup, it gave some of the people in the town of Yauntville an opportunity to exchange items. They would put things out, and the first night it was like uh, uh, they have a tractor parade in Calistoga. Everybody goes out. They're all on the street. Well, here the people would all make their rounds, and they would, it would move from one house to another uh, of the items that were being put out and collected. So we've seen this. Um, the last few years, I think the last year, I don't think they did that. Now, you can help me with that because we weren't involved in any of that, but it gave an opportunity for people to make that collection. And, and uh, we would follow up on a Saturday morning and bring uh, three trucks down with two drivers, one driver and a person to help, and he, he was able to step out of the right-hand side and jump and load, load that, load the trash. Um, that was the council's decision that they wanted to, to do this in this fashion. And we've continued that till this day, um, till last year, and performing that type of service. Um, in the 80s, uh, there was some $50,000 worth given for on a grant system to each one of the, the cities in the county. And then again, some 25,000. And those, were, those dollars were used for the cleanup at that time that Yountville took advantage of in doing. And there were two cleanups a year, and as Steve mentioned, yeah, they limited it to one cleanup a year. Um, uh, success, customers, uh, as Steve mentioned, uh, Cadillac, people just put it out there in front and we did it. We put something there for the person, uh, if they had metal or, or any of those things, we would go through under the truck and pick that up uh, uh, kind of separately in, in, in the fraction. So um, it's your decision, I think. Uh, Steve is here. We work for the, I would say, our franchises with the JPA and, 
and we want what you want, uh, you, you know, and, and uh, you're going to have our full cooperation whichever direction you choose to uh, to choose to, to, to go, but um, if you don't if you don't want any services, that's fine. Uh, uh, Saint Helena doesn't have one. Calistoga doesn't have one. The county doesn't have one that we work with. Just to pass that information on. Uh, some communities has felt that that uh, it it makes people throw keep their stuff in their backyard instead of cleaning up when they got it because they can know if they wait they can wait for the cleanup and get rid of it and so they don't do the cleanup. But um, anyway, uh, we're pleased and honored to be able to to serve you here in Yonville. Thanks. So. And, and before I let, I'll let you go, I, I'll invite other questions also, but the first one I want to ask you, if I can, goes back right to that uh, initial, and I think it's 1995. Uh, if I read this correctly, the grant money was ratepayer subsidized, is what it says here. It says uh, a ratepayer rate payer subsidized grant. Ratepayer subsidized the money that was... Uh, um, no, it was not. So you're saying basically you – where did that money come from that supported the cleanup initially? The, the money that came from came from our profits okay. to do that. So that technically time. it came from the ratepayers, but not as a, an additional yeah. cost. You took it out of the profits of the existing of, of cost. Company. Okay. Right. And is there the potential for additional grants like that in the future, or have you eliminated that – not not program. totally, not totally. I think it's certainly up for discussion with the JPA. So given that we have less than $4,000 in the balance, if we are discussing subsidizing that to get a rate, you know, get the seven or 8000 required, I think one of the questions council will have is, is that a one-time thing? Is it a multi-year thing that we have to be prepared for? You know, or is it? How how does that grant get replenished? I think replenished? that comes back to the again to the JPA and 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 uh, in, in, in March. I, I I can't speak to that. I think the gentleman standing up behind you is ready, you ready to address that. <laughs> but be, before I let Bob, before I let you go, if are there any other questions of counsel of Bob at this point? No, thank you. Bob. Okay, thank you very much, and and Steve, welcome. Mayor Dunbar, members of council, Steve Letterer with uh, Environmental Management of the county, but I guess here really is the manager of Upper Valley Waste Management Agency, which is the uh, JPA that was formed in 1995, Yountville, St. Helena, Calistoga, and the northern part of the unincorporated county. So I'll, I'll try and address um, kind of how the rates are done, and that will kind of tie back also into the uh, – um, the $50,000, which then became $75,000 in free services that are uh, part of the original contract. So um, Council Members Hall's question about uh, essentially the revenue and, and the rates. The entire area the, um, is treated as a, as a single operational area. And essentially the way the rates are um, set is every May 1st, we receive a set of financials from the company, which are audited financials, which are looking at the previous calendar years of, uh, of operation. We look at expenses and we look at revenue, um, essentially from all sources. And then um, most of that is looking backwards as to what happened in, in the past year. There were some forward-looking things like CPI and fuel costs and, and those sort of things. And essentially looking forward, we uh, set the rates for the coming year based on the amount of revenue that's expected to come in, the amount of expenses, and then the rates are obviously set in order to balance those. And then there is a fixed profit margin, which is uh, part, of the, uh, part of the contract, which is, I believe, about 9%, 9 or, 9 or 10 percent. So essentially every year um, the company is going to make their um, uh, contractual amount um, they can't make less, but also they can't make more. So that's sort of the nature of any, any sort of franchise uh, agreement. 
the uh, when the original contract was uh, signed, the original franchise agreement back in 1995, there was an agreement that the company would provide, um, and Mr. Rogers has been calling it a grant. I guess you kind of call it whatever you want. Essentially, that East Jurisdiction received $50,000 worth of free services. So there was never any money that actually changed hands, but. The, um, each jurisdiction had um, essentially that much money in uh, Upper Valley's bank that when they called and said, hey, can you do this, can you do that, the company would show up and, and then they would do a, essentially a paper transaction, knocking that am amount of money um, off the quote-unquote money that was in the bank. So um, over time, all of the jurisdictions um, uh, went through that first $50,000. About four or five years ago, um, for a lot of different reasons, um, the franchise agreement was extended um, out to 2025, which is the current uh, current expiration date. And as part of that, an additional $25,000 was given to uh, um, to each jurisdiction. And again, each jurisdiction chose to use that how uh, they saw it fit. Uh, Yountville, of course, did the cleanup days. Calistoga did leaf bins every fall. Um, St. Helena has really used very little of their money. Most of, They still have most of theirs in the bank. Uh, county has used theirs for things like creek cleanup and uh, the cleanup of the ecological, I don't know if I'm pointing in the right direction, <laughs> the, uh, the cleanup of the ecological uh, preserve. Um, a couple of years ago there was a big cleanup. We, uh, county used some of its money for that. Um, so that's kind of where we are. You know, everybody had ultimately $75,000 of "Quote unquote free service," and you know, um, Yountville has used all but thirty-seven hundred and seventy-three dollars, if if I think that's the right number. So, so that money was not allocated annually. No, no, that was a life. That was of, a lump sum over the the life of the contract. The contract's now to twenty twenty-five. So we basically have thirty-eight hundred dollars to get us to. 2025, technically. That is correct. Okay. Yes, you, you've used up. I mean, if you had used less earlier, you would have more, right. but it, it was, yes, it's a life of the contract. And this is not money. money that ratepayers have paid. This was a free give back in service. Correct. Okay. Uh, Vice Mayor, you have a question? Well, I guess it's on that statement you just made there. My assumption would be is that, um, let's say there's a pickup and it costs $10,000. That cost is kind of thrown back into the company's cost and then they come at the end of the year. So, I mean, essentially ratepayers are paying for it because it increased the cost of, of their company. Is that correct? Or is it after the 9% profit is calculated? I assume it's before. Um, you know, I, I, I'm not 100% sure. So the actually. labor that they have for that day, that increases their labor cost for that given year that it was used is my assumption and then i mean it's 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 paid for it's just in there in a different way does that sound um, correct does that make sense uh, bob you want to comment on that i would say i would just say if you're going to comment i would want to have yeah. you come up so we can hear it because we're recording and we're on the internet and all that fun stuff so uh, They, uh, the service uh, on, on the cleanup, we, we always assess the same rate, whatever the JPA rate was, to do the, the service. Okay, whatever that rate was, that was the rate in which we, which, which we assessed. Did we do something else with it? No, we didn't. Uh, that, that was the rate. If it was on a Saturday, uh, the, as far as the Saturday goes, there was no overtime accounted for it at the time to pad that, pad the rate, should I say, to bring those guys in. We took it at the same rate that we did uh, uh, under our regular rate structure to perform that service for the for the town of Yontville. Now, you know, uh, uh, coming back to the our profits afterwards, it was all after. All that work was done and it was paid for with, as the company did perform the service to do the job for Yonville. We didn't specifically take it out, but it was part of the cost of, of overall 
uh, the Up Valley, and Yauntville wanted to clean up, and we did the clean up, and it was part of our part of our 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 our, our fee structure of our profits were 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 counted in there. So I, I don't know if that helps. I I'm, I, th- I, I don't know. That you're satisfied. Well, I guess my my point is that when I look at some of our our, our alternatives, this idea of a ratepayer surcharge. Correct me if I'm wrong. It would be taking the ratepayer surcharge instead of burying it in. It would be putting it on somebody's on somebody's bill as a separate line item. Because I think what we've been doing kind of is burying it in there, and those costs get now. Yeah, what uh, what Bob was saying is that um, uh, that essentially for the for the town cleanup, of course, they would come out, they would provide a service, they would not get paid for it, so there'd be missing revenue, sure. if you will. And um, and Bob is saying actually the expenses associated with that were not part of what was submitted for um, um, as, for the ratepayer. It actually kind of came it came out of their nine percent, uh-huh. so. So it's after. It's not. So it did come it's, after. That it's was after. the question. Well, it's, yeah, it's, it's, out, of, sure it's out of their one, nine. Council members so, talking at a time. Yeah, out of their nine percent profit, not out of um, what got, if you will, funneled into uh, the rate payers for the next year. Okay. Thank you. So, Councilor Hall, did you have a question? I, or I'm sorry. That that was my follow-on question because I think it, it was maybe unclear the way it was presented. So I do have a follow-on question though. If he's not, if he's, yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, so. When you said, I think you said nine to ten percent is the set aside profit. Is that operating or net after depreciation, amortization, everything else? Because there's a very big difference if you're going to take the profit of those onto the books with regards to those non-cash items. I'm just making sure I understand so I can come back to the residents and make sure we articulate the right message. Yeah, I think you're getting into more detail than I have, but I believe that it's, um, um, I believe it's net. So it would be after you've taken the cost of new trucks and the facilities and everything else? Yeah. Okay. That answers my question. Yeah. Thank you. Councilmember Muller, any questions of uh, either representative? Well, yeah. When we go back and look at our, our last audited budget, I can't – or I actually, when the last time we got the 25000 I can't see – I can see that – the. I'm still confused about we do guarantee, based on the franchise and the JPA, a guaranteed profit. But I can't, so I can see that in the line item budget, because that's pretty much how we do that budget. But I can't then see those monies coming here. So that's where I'm confused. I'm just going to need some more explanation on how I can find that, for example, in the last time the JPA received 25000 can you help us help well, us figure sure. out the, where the, that is? Yeah. Um, again, think of it as a, as a credit, if you will, um, and just lump the whole thing together. Over, over time, Yountville got a credit of $75,000 worth of free service, and each time the town asked the company to show up and um, do a cleanup, there was a deduction on that. And um, I don't believe we have it with us, but, uh, but the company has a, a listing going all the way back to 1995 of each of those charges, and you can basically see the $75,000 coming down $7,500 Yeah, but that's, that's really not my question, so I'll save your time. Where did it come from? It's kind of really coming back to was it in the rate structure or was that profit decreased? And if that profit was decreased, you know, there will be a line item where the money – that money goes, and then some of that's going to go someplace else, and that's what I can't track. So that's where I'm just so confused. Well, I mean, and we get, I guess that's what we're trying to. We get the audited financials every year. That's this thick. I mean, we can we can certainly pull it out. Well, no, because the last time it was done was '95, right? Where we got the twenty-five thousand, or. Uh, when was the last time we got that twenty-five thousand? No, the, the, the program that itself was, started in ninety-five with right, fifty thousand. Last time and then we got the twenty-five was in 07. 07 was an additional twenty-five thousand. The extension, yeah, yeah, the extension was in two thousand and six or two thousand and seven. Right. There so if you look at the financials for 07, that's what I'm trying to figure out, because it'll, it'll just have once we say we make 
a decision about a surcharge. Well, if they've always been paying it versus something new, again, it's what we tell our constituents. If, and we let want to let be me try clear. to paraphrase because I think I think everybody's asking the same question, which is, is this truly a free give back service from Upper Valley Disposal, or are the ratepayers fronting the money and then there, it's called a credit on the back end? Is that a fair question? And what we've been told, Mr. Personi said, it is a free give back from the company as a community benefit. That, is that a fair uh, paraphrasing of, of what you said? So, yeah, that's true. After, is, after, our operational, after our operational profits. Yeah, and Mr. Letterer is saying that that, that that is audited and verified to be the case. That, yeah. That's is, correct. Is that, okay, because well, I think I'm hearing the same question asked over and over again. And hopefully that, and if it's different questions you're asking, please feel free to continue. No, I, I just could not find that when I looked in 07. That's right. why I was confused and I wanted him to help, help me kind of focus in on, maybe I was looking in the wrong place. So in whose 07 we, books are you talking about? Okay, the JPA every the JPA's year. JPA's books. The JPA, what we get every year are audited financials and therefore how much the expenses and how much the revenue is minus the profit. Uh, and at that time, you know, you can see where the profit was. I just can't see where this credit came out. So maybe I'm looking in the wrong spot if that's the case because it was a one-time thing that now we've drawn down on. That's, so it just helps us, you know, be able to figure out where it's coming from. Yeah. Well, also keep in mind the, the way it's set up. There won't be a single um, 25000 or since there are four members, $100,000 um, line item in the books because, again, it's, it's really handled more as a, as a credit or more of a, as a bank account. Um, you know, I guess somewhere on their books they know that in 2007 they knew they were going to have to provide 25000 or $100,000 worth of service for the four, but really it doesn't happen until the jurisdictions ask for that service, and that service, we may ask for that service in 2017, or we may ask for that service in, you know, in Yountville's case, $7,000 was asked for right off the bat, so that came off the account. Um, like I said, St. Helena hasn't done anything with their money, so... Um, but, but so. I think part of the confusion, and maybe I'm the one that's confused about this, when you say money comes off the account, money doesn't really come off the account. We're saying it's it's not real money, it's paper money, it's so service, there isn't yeah. a deduction from the budget, it's just services are provided at no cost to the town or the other cities up Valley. We see no additional cost. It's you're saying, and, and Mr. Pasoni is saying, there is no additional charge factored in to the rate payer, knowing that in the future there will be a cleanup debt. That is, you that are, the the that rate is, is purely based on the JPA's contracted garbage pickup That's correct. and recycle. That is the that is the position that. And Councilmember Dornbecker, I haven't given you a chance to ask any questions. And I just happen to have one. I'm sorry. But so what I w would like to uh, understand and be clear about is, so there's a credit on the books for $25,000, and the town uh, says, yes, we would like to do that day, and the $7,500 is just taken from that credit. But the, the costs that it cost you to do that day are not deducted from your profit line either. Is that correct? I mean, you don't you you don't then t t take the cost of the you know the staff and the three trucks and all of the rest of it and put that in your audited budget either. Is that true? Right. That that cost is not factored back into the rate tables. Thank you. That's that's what I needed to hear. Vice Mayor, you still have a look of having a question? No? I have no more questions. Okay. Thank you very much, Steve. Are there members of the public that would like to comment? Please, Billy, come forward. Thank you very much for the generous 
service you have provided. I have never lived anywhere where we didn't have a free, at least one free trash pickup. Uh, Billy Hewitt, Nine Landy Way. Um, we get requests for charitable donations, and this is almost like a charitable donation from Upper Valley uh, Services. Uh, perhaps we could have matching funds. We have 3,700 in the in the bucket ready to spend. I think from the back, if I heard Mr. Pistoni correct, he's willing to perhaps provide some more services in the future to Yauntville. Did I hear correctly? Uh, I mean, you know, I know you're not supposed to answer me, but that's something. I heard and interpreted it, and I feel like it's a very small line item, even if we pay it all. I think it's a very small line item uh, for the service provided to the greatest number of citizens. And I can't see that it's, uh, you know, like uh, Mr. Pisoni said, it's an opportunity for people to go out and collect somebody's junk and then next year they put it out as their junk. So we, we are doing a, a great deal of recycling. Um, but I do think it is, um, I get a lot of questions from uh, friends and neighbors who never come to these meetings um, about are we ever going to um, have this uh, service again. And even it's carried over into some people's attitude of donating to other services in town, like the arts. Uh, you know, they don't want to donate to the Silver Twist if they aren't getting a free garbage pickup. I mean, you know, it's, it's sort of convoluted, but there are people out there thinking, if I don't get something back, then I don't want to give. Separate, you know, separate items, so. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you for all your time on this. <laughs> Any other uh, public comments about this? No? Uh, then I will bring it back for further discussion. Actually, town manager. A, a couple um, clarification points that I want to share with. <clears throat> You'll note that the <clears throat> when we refer to the fact that the um, grant, the credit, however you want to look at it, it was always tied, and I'm going to use it, it's an operating cost to business because each of those grants were conditioned and tied to the granting of the franchise or the extension of the franchise. So it's a rolled up cost that's put into ultimately the cost of doing business. Um, a question was asked by the council, is this going to be a one-time thing or are we going to need to look at a funding structure for multiple years? The answer is, depending on your policy, you know, if you want to continue with a community cleanup ongoing and going forward, we need to identify a long-term funding structure through the existing balance of the franchise agreement, which is 2025, unless there is a uh, charitable donation on the part of Upper Valley, which I, I don't believe really is in the cards. I'm not going to speak for Mr. Pistoni, but I don't, I don't see that in that way as a, a free donated service. It would have to be a contractually negotiated consideration. So from that standpoint, when the council looks at those policy options, we do need to think if that's something you want with a going forward program, we need to authorize our Upper Valley Agency representative, if that's the route you want to go to, to look at the franchise or the uh, smaller uh, annual surcharge, as Ms. Hewitt pointed out. It really is a relatively small cost if that's a program that you want to continue or you're going to look at it as potentially a general fund funded program going forward. Thank you for that additional clarification. Um, Yeah, are you asking a uh, follow-up to staff? Yeah, Vice Mayor. I have just a question on the staff report. Um, so I was thinking about it. On the page uh, two, you talk about the alternative <coughs> mechanisms to pay for the costs. Um, and you refer to a ratepayer surcharge um, estimated to cost between $0.60 cents and $1.15 per month. 
is that range based on how far you go? Is dollar fifteen per month if you're doing the curbside pickup versus the lower cost items? That's correct. Do you know what a percentage? This goes to Council Member Hall's question, I believe. Item two is establish a franchise fee. We would potentially could set the franchise fee at a percentage, which I assume is going to be straight passed through um, to uh, the rate payers, um, that would equal that same amount. Do you know what that number would be? The I'd have to calculate that that could be, if that's the council's prerogative, that, that certainly can be done. Um, and that's a mathematical equation. Uh, we're probably looking at... So it'd be a small percentage. I mean, it'd be a small... And then the policy question on that, going back to your pavement management discussion, would be if you wanted to look at adding a component. Now, if you look at consideration of a franchise fee, we do have to make some findings, and I don't want to jump ahead. This is more policy, but that, that would be a factor that could be included in the franchise fee, and then we pay for it. We would be paying it. Again, I want to point out that in a, in a franchise fee case, Upper Valley is going to collect and then remit just like the cable company and PG&E does. In this case, they would, and then we would turn around and give them a check back. I'm probably going to request a check and a check rather than just a credit. Yeah. Um, but that would be how that funding, that program through the franchise fee component would look like. Okay. And the cost, I just what you bring up, the one variable on either of those approaches is that the cost will have to be based on the current cost structure approved by the uh, JPA. So if there's a big increase in the cost of service or the tipping fee, we will see a, cons you know, a, a commensurate increase in the cost of the service. So let's uh, first handle the first part of the uh, issue here being the status of, of cleanup. Um, I'd like to have, yes, um, Councilmember Muller? Could I just make some additional comments to all the other comments? Yes. Um, once we get to the part where we're going to talk about, you know, how we're going to do it and how we're going to pay for it, I want to make sure that um, we do have, I would like to get some input regarding the, the pretty large paragraph on franchise fee. We might just have a franchise fee instead of a surcharge, but as has been mentioned, this is something that is an ongoing discussion on the, the JPA board, so I would certainly like to hear, should we drop this discussion? Should we continue to flush it out? Which way you would like to see this go? Because uh, in addition to the wear and tear on our streets by the truck, and the county does have a franchise fee that they collect in what's called Zone 1. That's all the county south of Yonville to the City of Napa. The City of Napa has their own trash service that's different and distinct from here. So there is a precedent in the Napa County for doing that to, to pay for streets. In addition, one, Yonville's main focus on the JPA board, we've been talking a lot about this cleanup day and the funds for that. Calistoga, a major issue for them is they want and are discussing, we haven't got there yet, having a similar type surcharge or maybe raising the franchise fee. Their main issue is hazardous household waste cleanup because, and we haven't even talked about that at all. What do our people do? Is that something they even want? So that might be part and parcel of some input if we ever go with a franchise fee that that would go into that as well. So. And then one comment, since we do not have mandatory service, anything that we, and there's about 20, 25% of our residents that don't pick, pick up, I think, they use something else. We do not have to do Prop 18 for some of these. So just to kind of, we can bear that in mind. I'd like to first have the council discuss if we're even going to continue <clears throat> this program. Then we can worry about if so, how is it going to be paid for? That's why I would like to address the first set of uh, alternatives and hear discussion specifically about that. We won't discuss paying for something if we're not going to continue to ask for it. So let's decide if we are going to ask for the continued service and in what form. And then we'll worry about how it's going to be paid for, if we could. So uh, is there a discussion to be had on do we want to continue the curbside service? Does the debris box pickup sound like a better alternative? Uh, Councilmember Dornbecker, I'll be happy to go first. Thank you. Um, you know, 
The residents, I think, um, from the year ago that I joined the town council, the first thing that we did was raise the water rates and utility rates, uh, the water utility rates. And I think that the residents are feeling um, the sense I get when I talk to people that that we are, you know, we're cavalierly, even in this terrible economy, raising their rates. And so I honestly feel that this is something that the town does seem to really uh, enjoy and particip the participatory on that morning of my husband goes out and, you know, and he'll come back with all kinds of reports of what's out and about and did I want some more clay pots for flowers and things like that. And I honestly see a lot of neighbors coming by and we all, you know, talk and chat. I think for, nothing, for no other reason than the fact that, number one, we have a beautiful little town and I like the idea that everybody's interested in keeping it cleaned up. So I would like to see this stay as a staple in our annual uh, uh, services to our residents. I'll go with that. Thank you. Um, Councilmember Hall. Sure. Um, I <clears throat> agree. I think that this is something that residents have come to expect. It's obviously was very highly vocalized at the time when it didn't occur. Um, I think that, you know, the, the social benefit of it, I'm not going to argue that one way or the other. Um, I haven't come through your trash lately, as far <laughs> as you know. Um, but what I would say is that, um, you know, it is something that uh, I, I do hear about still to this day, and it's a service that I believe that we would like to assist in coordinating, and we can discuss, we can discuss how to pay for it and the frequency. I don't believe more than annually is necessary, um, whether it's independently by residents or so or, or at a uh, centralized location or locations. Um, I'm open to discuss that, but I do believe it's a service that we want to continue to provide to the residents of this community, and, and we just need to determine um, how we progress that. Thank you. Councilmember Muller? I agree. Everyone I've uh, talked to um, is very interested in continuing the service. Do you have a preference on whether it's a curbside or debris box? Um, I, I, I think that there's uh, curbside is um, something I find very attractive, and I think a lot of other people do too. There's a lot of downside to, to the drop box as specified in the staff report. I still think that we really need to evaluate the coupon or voucher because maybe not everybody wants to clean out their garage at the same time. Uh, so there's some value of uh, having that. You can use it whenever ever you want. So um, I'm okay with the curbside or the voucher program if we can work out the numbers to make it make sense. Okay, thank you. Vice Mayor. I'll generally agree. I, I think that uh, we should continue it. I would prefer the curbside. I think it makes most sense if you look at our community and um, – you know, potential mobility issues and loading up a car and doing all that kind of thing. I think it just, it, to me, it makes the most sense. Um, I have, I just have a feeling that the, I agree with you on the coupon, it sounds good. I, have, I think the, the financial part of that won't work out. That the way we do it now with the yard sale the first week and then the pickup the next week it seems to work, and I think we should continue with that, certainly next year. I agree with uh, the vice mayor specifically. Um, I see many problems with the debris boxes, uh, inappropriate trash being put in there. Everybody within 30 minutes drive coming and dumping their stuff in there. Um, I also find it very challenging for people, not only the mobility issues, we just don't have the vehicles to transport some of what we're talking about here. and so. Even getting it to a centralized location is not really practical. Um, so I think if we're going to do it at all, it should be curbside. Uh, I don't see how we're going to enforce a, a non-rate paying neighbor from going out early in the morning and dumping their stuff on their neighbor's pile. But um, that's something that we're never going to be able to resolve. So I, I don't think we can count on it being purely rate payer service based. I think that's unrealistic. So what I'm hearing is everybody wants to continue curbside service. Now we can have a discussion about um, how we want to fund that. Uh, initially, we have 
half of the money credited, so it would be a 50% off potentially the, the next year we do that. But how do we want to factor in to our general fund? Do we want to charge a franchise fee? Do we want to charge some kind of surcharge? So that's that's where we are. And let's just kind of keep that same order. Councilmember Doran back there. Thank you. My question about the franchise fee is if that is not a pass-through fee that then goes to the um, so the people who subscribe to the to the pickup trash pickup, and in that case, then it's not an advantage that the town has provided for them. So I I really I'm just going to come out and say it. I really think that it should be a line item in the general fund. Thank you. Councilmember Hall. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, the people that are utilizing the service should be the ones that pay for it, generally. Um, we've seen what subsidies do and how it has affected water rates and the communication of that to residents and everyone's entitlement to having less expensive water um, at the cost, great cost, extreme cost to the community itself, the town. Um, so I don't support necessarily subscribing to a general fund amount rather than, um, I, and I'm not exactly sure how to fund this because I'm misunderstanding obviously the value of a franchise fee if it's a direct pass through back to the community where upper valley waste management derives great benefit from utilizing the roads that we maintain with trucks that have been empirically proven to uh, more quickly uh, damage the roads. And that's not to say that we don't get a great service, but we also pay for it. That being the case, I would find a franchise fee with some share owned by Upper Waste Management who's utilizing our wonderful streets to pick up our garbage that they receive profit for, 9% plus at the net operating level after depreciation of their vehicles that are driving on our streets um, to the benefit of the resident. That would be my supposition that there should be some share in that. And I don't know how we come to that arrangement, um, and that may not be rational, but that would be my instruction. Right. And I'll just paraphrase it. Maybe staff can uh, expound on this, but I, we're not in a position to charge a franchise fee tonight, Understood. no matter what. So if we decide that we're interested in proceeding with any kind of funding structure, that's going to be happening at a later date. I understand. I understand so, that. I'm just saying just that would be my direction. We're providing guidance of yeah. you're talking about some concept of a shared franchise fee Correct. as your recommendation, and we've heard one recommendation as a general fund line item subsidy. Yes. Okay. Council Member Muller. Um, I also agree that uh, the, the rate payer should pay for this. Um, you know, charging everybody for something that not everyone who uses trash service just doesn't really make, make sense to me. I also agree with Council Member Hall that uh, what I see for now, we do have community uh, promotion <coughs> funds set aside that could cover the event until we do the, the next budget with the addition of 37, almost $3,800 from upper waste management. So that to me is how we could do it for the next year. And I would like to take some more time to at least discuss more thoroughly the, uh, you know, the pluses and minuses of having a franchise fee. And we could get some numbers on what that could cost, how much of the roads are we going to use for that or not, or this service, uh, again, hazardous household waste. And as part of that, you know, there are numbers of all involved that having mandatory service might offset some of that. So I, I think I would like to have that as a later discussion for funding for future years. Okay, so another kind of vote for an analyzed franchise fee structure. Vice Mayor. I am going to, I, I believe, generally agree with what Council Member Hall and Muller just said. I, I would look at this in a two-step process. Um, first of all, we have essentially half of an annual curbside pickup left as a credit. 
I think it's reasonable for expediency and knowing things take time um, to fund this next springs out of the general fund. Um, I, I don't I don't consider that to be. Uh, I, I think that's reasonable. Uh, I also think that it's reasonable for us to say we're doing this as a one time item and we're going to take a look at it for the long term. It should also give us the chance to at least look. We have somebody drive around town and count how many houses or, or, or get the folks at Upper Valley to say, how many times did you stop and, you know, was it of the 700 customers, was it really only 200? And then I think we get a better idea of whether we want to tack on a dollar a month to everyone when it's being used by 25% of people. Um, I just I have a real hard time getting a feel for the breadth. I think there's a, a breadth of people who are interested in this, but... It's it's still kind of hard to tell if it's you know a lot of a lot of people who are upset about it or a good vocal minority. I don't know the answer to that. So I I generally agree that it should be paid by the ratepayers, not by the community as a whole. Um, and uh, how we get to that, I believe they're not going to reopen up the contract. We have a contract till 2025. If we do a franchise agreement, it's going to be a pass through. I mean, let's be honest here. So. Anything we consider until 2025 is going to be a pass-through, unless somebody's going to tell me something wrong, which I am very confident I'm not wrong on that. So um, I think we have to look at that, and to me it's really going and saying how well used is it. We don't have that data. If we can get that this year, general fund subsidy for this one time, and then let's reevaluate it. Thank you. Um, I'm going to support uh, the recommendation that we uh, fund this the balance of this uh, this spring as a very minimum. I would also support that we do provide this as a service to the community through the general fund because I consider this something like what we do for our recreational services. Uh, some of the other services that we provide the community, we do not provide service to 100 percent of our residents. There's not a single service that we provide 100 percent of our residents. Um, so that criteria I don't think is, you know, that we don't need to hit that, th that threshold. I do respect the position of many of my neighbors who have said, you know, we're making record TOT numbers. We're generating all this revenue with our businesses in town. What's in it for the residents? And there's a lot that's in it for the residents, no question about it. But I see this as another way for the council to give back to the residents. I do. I, I think it's a, a relatively nominal amount of money that is a service provided to whomever needs it. And that number's going to change every year. Um, who just did a yard remodel? Or who just did cleaning out of a child's play set? Whatever it might be. Whether it was 150 people last year and it's going to be 300 next year, um, it's really tough to calculate. I worry that any – I don't like the idea of charging a, an additional fee, also known as a tax, on residents to provide this service. If it's uh, purely based on the fact that we have been providing it free, I, I certainly respect Councilmember Hall's position about comparing it to the water subsidy, uh, but we were also talking about a quarter of a million dollars compared to a, a few thousand dollars. And so I do define that differently. So I support, as the vice mayor initially threw out, that we definitely fund the, the balance of the next cleanup. Uh, and I, I also would still like to get some more numbers about how much money are we talking about, how many, how many rate payers are we talking about, just so we have a better understanding, how many pickups are we making. That We should just have that information anyway, whether we're paying for this out of the general fund or not. We need to know how many people are doing it so we can continue to evaluate it just like every other line item in the budget. So if it gets to the point of the cost benefit isn't there anymore, then we take it out of the general fund. So is that enough guidance for staff? You have provided guidance that will provide direction for us to continue the program at a curbside level. We will allocate the community promotion budget. I will exercise that arrangement for this upcoming spring. And you have 
provided yourself with additional opportunities to discuss the ongoing funding structure because <laughs> you haven't provided consensus on how to fund the program beyond the current year. But that's part of our upcoming budget discussion, so we'll incorporate that. It does sound, I mean, you, you just, I'm just being honest, you've, you've given, you've covered the first year, you haven't covered future years. Correct. And I would also encourage everyone that's listening is going to read about this, is that we need feedback from our residents about how critical this service is. We are ready to support it now, but we want to make sure that it's providing a service to a great number of people that live there. So thank you very much. And thank you. Yes. I'm sorry. Excuse Becker. me. One, One last, last comment. thing. One last comment. I'm hoping that um, because I do see the value in um, having a, having how many households actually do participate in that day monitored. If you could please pr uh, provide that information for us, we'd appreciate it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, and thank you, the Sony family, and Mr. Letter for being here to help talk through this whole process. I'd also like to thank Councilmember Moeller for being our representative and, and keeping that debate conversation going uh, for us, you know, with the JPA. So thank you very much. Thank you. We'll move uh, rapidly along to item B, which is a town hall seismic retrofit discussion considering adoption of a professional services agreement with Pound Management and Architectural Resources Group for a seismic retrofit project. Thank you, uh, Mayor Council. Uh, briefly, I want to give you a little understanding as to where this project is at. Um, and, and this is, previously we have done a, a space needs analysis study and a, a concept plan for a seismic retrofit renovation, renovation and remodel of Town Hall. And that came in in an estimated range in 2009 at between five and seven million dollars depending on the ultimate design. Um, at that point in time, we were in a very difficult and different economic structure. The council asked staff to continue to evaluate. Uh, we applied for some grants and we were not successful with FEMA grants on the seismic <coughs> component. Um, windows of opportunity had passed from the 80s when that was uh, a more appropriate and frankly, our risk factor was low compared to what they're funding for right now. Um, council has continued to say, look, we have an unreinforced masonry building. We're exposing our employees and our public. Uh, this is an example of where we will uh, look to, um, you know, need to build fund balance or a financing alternative. But um, one of the things that we wanted to propose to you is a minimum safety project. And I want to make sure that when we talk about this, that this is a project that focuses only on the improvements that are necessary to make the building seismically safe. And we needed to do more analysis. So the request tonight is one for you. To, if you find that you want to do this, we will need to bring back a budget amendment because this would be funded out of the capital projects fund and the funding is sufficient. But really what we're talking about is a more exact analysis and undertaking and cost estimating of what really would be required. Uh, staff estimates that the minimum seismic safety project somewhere in the neighborhood of a million and a half to two depending on uh, whether the roof has to come off and there's a temporary relocation. Um, so we're not talking about an insignificant project and we frankly don't have good information and we need some, some sound some sound numbers to be able to put two alternatives for the council to consider in your upcoming CIP discussions. During the last year and a half, I've also continued to meet with some financing folks to find out what our options and mechanisms might be. Uh, part of our team is interested and we'll, we will continue to look at some additional grants, but the FEMA grant that we were going for would only pay for about 20% of the, of the seismic retrofit. Um, you know, the good news, as you know, is we are improving our capital projects fund balance with our positive economic base that a few of you have shared. But um, where most of our revenue does need to go at this point in time above our operating expenses is to build up for capital projects such as the town hall remodel streets. Um, so with that, I just wanted to kind of remind you that you've asked us to kind of be working on some different alternatives, realizing that a five to seven million dollar 
more expansive project probably is not feasible at this time. So what we're really talking about is a combination of the engineering and the planning and the design to get us to a point where we would be able to say, yes, this is feasible. A ballpark realistic cost estimate would be X, and then I can take that number and get financing alternatives or structures for you. With that, I'll turn it over to Graham to talk to a little bit more about what the proposed technical work is. Before that happens, I just want to make sure that the council and everybody is clear on the scope of service we're looking for right now. We're not talking about any construction at, at this point. We're talking about designing a minimum safe renovation of the facility. That, that's correct, Mayor Dunbar, and I will say it might include something like replacement windows or a different roof material depending on what the work leads to, but you are not talking about uh, a replacement of the double wide trailer that's attached to town hall or the you know more expansive uh, remodel and new construction. We're talking about the work that is focused, the, the, the seismic retrofit is the focused and ancillary work necessary to support that or work that gets caused because when you do something, you've got to, you know, if you have to put big steel plates on something, you may need to relocate electrical where electrical currently was. So it would be directly related. I, I do think that's a great observation. But I was saying we are still at the design phase of this project. Right. It's Very preliminary. This is right. exactly so that. We're not, we're not rebuilding anything yet. We're finding out what it would cost and getting a general concept of what that scope of construction would be. And we can't do it without having professionals tell us what that plan will be. So, right. okay. Oh, thank you. you. Mayor, Council. Um, as your town engineer, um, I've read the evaluation report that was in December of 2008, which was brought to you before. Um, the building is 80 years old. It's susceptible to collapse in a major earthquake. Um, we've been fortunate not to have to been, been through that. Um, California building codes have changed. Um, we've only had preliminary information on this. What we're asking for is we've worked with pound management on the community center and the treatment plant projects. Um, they've done a lot of work with the town. We'd like to continue that working relationship um, by entering a professional services agreement to do some preliminary engineering design to look at what there are three options that were presented to you back in 2009 by ARG. Uh, we like to pursue those more, get enough design work done so that we can get a good cost estimate. So as part of our infrastructure discussion, capital improvement program workshop in January, uh, we can start to talk about this. How does this fit in the priorities of all the other projects in town in the capital improvement program? And hopefully by the time we get to adopting the budget for next fiscal year, um, we'd have some good numbers for discussing financing, for discussing, you know, how do we want to move forward? Um, you know, we would still need to do detailed design after um, the decision. This is sort of a go, no-go decision. Um, we would then have an idea of do we want to do a design, a bid, and a construction, or go straight to design build, which is another option that's been, um, the town hasn't done much of, but is an option that is out there that may be a good process for the town to pursue. Um, we also talked to pound management about the a contract, which we already have with, um, architectural design group, um, the town council, town went through an RFP process. Um, we already have a contract that's, you know, they've made their presentation to you. Uh, what we'd like to do is an amendment with them for the work that's in the proposal that's attached to the staff report. So we'd have a professional service agreement with Pound, um, and instead of them hiring ARG as a subcontractor or subconsultant, we do a separate amendment. So essentially that would be administering two contracts. Um, so it's just, we brought, packaged them together. We want uh, we're requesting one budget adjustment of $70,000, which would cover the cost of both of these uh, contracts, uh, well, the contract and the contract amendment. So with that, I can answer any questions you may have about the, the proposal. Questions? Councilmember Moeller? I do recall um, architectural RG, I don't know, yeah. something group. Resources, Resources group, uh, yes. Okay, going through that RFP, but now you're mentioning uh, ZFA, I don't recall who that is, and I uh, am confused about who the RFP was for. Okay, the RF RFP went out, and ARG was um, hired um, Zuko as their sub consultant. So that they were part of the original contract as a sub, and so essentially we bring them back in as the uh, prime and sub, -con sub consultant on as uh, under an amendment. 
So Zuko did the did the study in 2008 about the seismic stability of the building. What did ARG so they were, do? They were part of the team that was um, submitted a proposal. Yeah, I'm just I'm still just confused. Why there's three people and who's doing what? Okay. Um, essentially, pound management and Les Alspa and Oliver Dillable are here to answer any questions that you may have that I can't answer. Um, are with pound management, and essentially they are a, a management company. They did the management of the community center project. The, um, they've been doing some projects like the audio visual <coughs> equipment, um, some other miscellaneous projects. So essentially, an extension of staff. And so they'd be assisting me in working on this project, doing some truthing with the architect and engineers um, to essentially pull everything together for our staff reports and presentation to the council uh, for the capital improvement program, which they're also participating in and putting that together. On the other side with ARG and uh, Zuko is to do that design. Um, there's three alternatives are proposed. Uh, which one would be the best as they get into more details? Which would be most cost effective? And then they'll bring those recommendations to us when we start looking at the budget and the financing. So ZFA are the seismic specialists Correct. that the architects use Correct. ARG. Okay, that's all the questions I have for now. Okay. Thanks. Councilmember Hall. I have no questions at this time. Thank you. Councilmember Dornbecker. I have one, and that is that um, in the staff report, it says that they completed a seismic evaluation report in December of 2008. Correct. So, uh, what go is this now a, a different? Um, is this the, a design component? Right. Correct. That was just an evaluation of how susceptible is the building to seismic loads. And now what they would say is, okay, to prevent the building from collapsing, what sort of design do we need, and construction do we need to, to seismically bring it up to code? And uh, may I ask also, on what basis does staff believe that the minimum seismic safety project may be achievable in the one and a half to $2 million range? That's preliminarily based on some real sound preliminary numbers on what, I mean, it's, it's a ballparking and that's why we're not saying it in firm numbers. A, a big component is there are a couple different approaches that can be evaluated for the seismic retrofit. And, um, you know, if the roof has to come off and depending on whether you're putting braces in or doing shear wall, one of the big components is you know, kind of hard for folks to work in that environment. So then if we have to move people out of that into temporary. So there's some things that we have to flush out or there may be, you know, for example, one approach may cost more on the construction but have less negative impact. Uh, one thing that's been looked at is we might take all the roof off, replace it not with the clay tile but replace it with something that looks similar to retain the look or, you know, maybe we'll say the look is really important on the front facing here, but a different roof structure could be used on what faces the, the rear of the building. So that's where some of those components come into play. Um, and I think, you know, we don't want to come to you. Uh, part of what this exercise really is about is not saying, oh, the minimum project's a million and a half, we're comfortable, go down the road, start it, and get there and find out, ooh, it's not a million and a half, it's two. I'd rather know and have a contingency built in so that we can evaluate that. And we simply do not have the technical competence, no disrespect to myself and Graham, but that's not, I mean, we want some real numbers and we think we can get, this will get us to some real opportunities so that the council and the community can evaluate. And I'm being very optimistic and talking to folks, you know, two million is an achievable number for us to finance as well. I'm very comfortable with that. Well, I had some questions about the actual um, um, pound management um, um, presentation of, you know, it'll, uh, it'll take approximately two, point, two and three quarters months to come up with a construction document phase. And, but I'm going to defer those questions. But I do have a question for you, Steve, and that is, in the process of the of the 2008 seismic evalu evaluation report, was the roof mentioned or not mentioned? 
I can provide uh, all those copies. What the evaluate, there were three things that happened basically in 2008 when we brought ARG. One was they did a complete assessment of the building condition. So yes, we know all of our problems. Okay, and then, we know the all of them. And they provided some basic understandings and some concepts of what could be looked at. Another component that they also did was a space needs analysis because basically we don't fit in the building. I mean, and that was also when, if you recall, at, at a point in time, the library space was the library and there was questions about what did we need to do. So we've Im implemented some parts of it but as you all know, to be fully effective, we still have to utilize the 20-year-old double wide as a part of our record storage conference and meeting space. So part of this, part of the initial exercise was what would a renovation of this building plus the possible consideration of new construction to meet the long-range space needs, what would that look like altogether? And that's what the initial concept. We stopped at that point. And that was so. Nothing has moved forward at that from that point on. And the council has asked us, how how do we pick that up? So right now we know that if we wanted to go that route, we've got a ballpark estimate that would need to be fine tuned, but five to seven million, and then we'd go into design if that's the approach the council wanted to do. We think, and we've listened to you, and you said, is there something else we might be able to do? And we think there is. So that's with this minimum project. So that's why you're still going to have on paper, we're going to show you kind of an A and there's an A and a B approach to resolve the seismic retrofit of Town Hall. Thank you. Vice Mayor. Well, that <clears throat> my only question has to do with kind of what you said is the A and the B. I think what seems to be good about this is it, it's not saying you have to buy everything at once, is that it's a phased approach. Correct. Um, and I, I guess my real question, and maybe anybody can answer this, is the work that's being done here may be focusing only on the seismic issue, but is that looked at as a step one? It's useful as well than if you want to renovate the interior of the building. Correct. And I would also say if you chose to go with the more extensive project, a lot of that groundwork. I mean, we're talking about soils testing analysis to know how, you know, that kind of stuff is going to be germane to any of the project that we go forward. So, you know, not 100%, but I would say a good 70% of this effort will be germane to whatever future renovation would be appropriate. Th this is really focused on getting us the basic to know the minimum and define what the minimum is. Thank you. And I'm going to not allow Councilmember Dornbecker to defer her question any longer. I'm going to ask it. Uh, how does the October 24th letter relate to the, the the letter coming from Pound relate to the $34,389? Uh, because clearly one doesn't line up with the other. Uh, okay. Yeah, there's so a table attached to that if letter. If that was your, going to be your question. Um, and if you look at the, it's the page before the Architectural Resources Group letter of September 16th. And so what they did there is they broke down, the cost at the top is the total project fee, which is the 32000 32670 Correct. And so what's, that is the um, breakdown of phase one and phase two, which is the, the uh, Great, design. Graham, hold on just a second. I want to make sure all the council is on that page. I don't think everyone is. Um, so after the letter, there's a oh, uh, the okay. two pages of spreadsheet from Pound Management, which is called um, Project Management uh, oh, okay. Scope Breakdown. And then the page after that is Pound Management, uh, Yauntville Town Hall Seismic Upgrade, Project Management Fee Calculation. And then the total proposed uh, base fee is 32670 It's a vertical page, not a horizontal Correct. page. Correct. Half. Right before the letter from. Just the top half of the information. Correct. I think everybody's looking at the same thing. Thank you. And then there's also a um, funding in there, or some of the the um, budget requests is for reimbursable expenses, copying, and things like that. So the thirty two six seventy still isn't the thirty four three eighty nine. And that's where the reimbursable costs okay are, are added okay. to that to come to the thirty four. And Councilmember Dornbecker, was that going to be your question? Yes, I didn't see how. Uh, when I look at the. Um, the, co the subtotal cost of each of these components, it seems to come out to a lot more. 
Right. And so what they've done is pulled out certain elements of the overall. But we'll certainly ask okay. um, Pound's representation sure. to discuss oh, it even further. At the microphone, if you want. I just wanted to explain that. Well, uh, let's sorry. So let's just make sure, Graham. Are you are you finished with what you were going to present? Sure. Yeah, it was I'll, just um, if in the last paragraph of the staff report, it just talks about the thirty-two thousand. Um, but additional 1719 has been added for reimbursable expenses for the total of 34000 Got it. Okay, great. So I just want to kind of formally welcome the public to speak, and you being the public now. Mayor, I have one more question. Uh, uh, sorry, we do have one more question. Is this of staff? Uh, it's actually of Arnold. He's not here. So if I can ask it later when he comes Certainly. back. Certainly. Before you sit back down, now we do want you to come up. <laughs> so Welcome. <laughs> Hi, I'm Oliver Dibble. I'm with uh, Pound Management, and uh, I've been working with uh, Stephen and, and uh, Graham to put this thing together. I think that part of the confusion in the October 24 document is that the individual phases include both the Pound Management fees and the ARG fees. Uh, that so would do that's it. That's why it appears to be a bigger number. I see. Thank you. It's been corrected by Graham so that they're distinct and separate. Okay. Originally, the proposal was um, for pound management to be the prime, and so, ARG and C Zuko would be the subs. Now we split it into two. Right. Okay. Okay. And the benefit to the the benefit to the town is that we don't apply any fee to the ARG portion. Right. It's a, it not there would be no administrative fee, which can be ten or fifteen percent. Sure. So, based on any of the questions we were just asking staff, is there any additional information you wanted to provide, or are you good? No, we're good. Okay. Ready to start. Thank you. Uh, is there any other comment from the public tonight uh, on this project, on this item? No? Seeing none. Uh, and Councilmember Muller, do you, you don't think staff can answer the well, question? Well, yeah, we maybe, need? maybe. Uh, maybe somebody maybe could Graham see can. if uh, our town attorney is, <clears throat> is just outside. Uh, well, I'll try. Maybe you already know. Okay, I'm kind of back to my original question. Who are, who are the players and how is all this involved? So this contract is with Pound. They're going to hire subs. So, no. There will be a contract, professional service agreement with Pound, and then we would do an amendment with ARG to their existing contract, which we already have in place. And we don't have that here? Uh, no, it's not attached. Okay. All right, then uh, that answers one question why I couldn't find that. The, then the other question is, so if this is the contract with Pound, uh, how come we're deciding that errors and omission insurance is uh, okay to delete? Uh, this has been a contract that we've um, negotiated with Pound Management on past projects, oh. and the town attorney did review it and uh, felt it was okay. But Arnold can, yeah. um, the town attorney can I just always discuss was, it further if you. The if reason you want. I'm asking, I was always in the assumption if you're a licensed professional, you had to have that. So that's really where my question is kind of coming from. So I'm well, just, and, and if you Pound, could maybe restate your question for the town attorney so he could hear exactly what you're. It was all, okay, so since, you know, Pound has got architects and engineers and, and subcontractors, it was always my impression that when you had licensed professionals, so I'm going to take a test annually, that um, you always needed to have errors and omission ins insurance. But it's okay I, not I, to. I just don't understand why. I think part of the issue is that um, Pound Management is not the engineer or architect. They're not the licensed. Um, Zuko and ARG would be the licensed, and they will have. They do have the professional service agreement, standard agreement. And with Pound Management, it's more administrative. Um, but Arnold can ex and expand on that. Mr. Mayor, members of the council, that's basically the the concept. Uh, Pound serves as a project manager. They, unless I'm mistaken, I don't believe they hold engineering or architectural licenses. Right. Uh, That's correct. Yeah. And so uh, because of that, that is why they don't are, are required or mandated to have errors and omissions uh, coverage. But certainly any architect or engineer that is going to service this, um, this contract will be required to have E&O coverage. Okay. Thanks. So, any additional? Um, we've we've heard from the public. We basically it's up to us for discussion now. So, are there um, comments to be made, Councilmember Hall? Um, yes. So, <clears throat> I think I understand what we're 
what our objective is in this, and that is really, uh, without taking everyone else's perspective, it is really to have pound management and these other subs, ARG and ZFA, I'm sure I got all the acronyms correct, um, to come in, do an evaluation, a follow-up evaluation of the facility that we're actually sitting in tonight to make a recommendation um, of sorts about things that we may be able to undertake that would not be, and I'll use the words cost prohibitive at this juncture, that we might be able to finance or spend the money uh, out of our budget to make this building more seismically, re seismically retrofit. Um, and so what we're looking at approving tonight, if I understand correctly, is not just the 34389, which is currently what's been spent plus uh, reimbursables, but also to then to include an additional amount up to $70,000 for the others. Is, is that sort of the final piece that I'm to understand? Correct. Actually, nothing has been spent at Pardon this me, phase. Right. So the 70000 would be to enter into the two contracts and to authorize the budget allocation. But if then maybe on my understanding of reimbursable expenses is wrong. Is this an estimated amount of reimbursable expenses? Okay. Thank you. Sorry. No, nope, I understand. That's why I want to check. Um, okay. Then I think that what you're suggesting or what we're proposing here is a $70,000 um, investment to have a further understanding of what our current seismic retrofitting issues for this particular building, and I'm assuming this also includes where staff reside and, and are doing work every day um, and the potential for what we might be able to um, uh, protect ourselves or um, eliminate risks. Um, but this does not get the work done. What this does is basically give us the uh, diagram or the plan, if you will, to how we get that work done. So failing that, I mean, I don't, I don't see that there's a lot of discussion. It's whether or not we agree with that being the right, um, the right activity um, and whether or not we agree with that being the right activity. Um, not being someone in this type of business, my, you know, my supposition would be the building is old. It's been here a long time. We should probably undertake some sort of activity. I, I, I trust that we've got the right people on the, on the team and that we've got the right contracts in place, that the town attorney has reviewed it, and I, I can feel comfortable with it. Um, I would go back to my question that I always seem to fall back on, and that is, you know, where I see where we say we're going to take these monies from. Do we feel comfortable that we've got these effectively planned and that, you know, they are going to lead to much larger, potentially larger capital expenditures that we may or may not necessarily have immediate funding for and how we go after that will be probably the next phase of discussion. But do we feel like these are adequately planned and, and how we cover this is either taking away from some other project that may have a higher immediate need. We can't know that because we can't predict the next earthquake. But my, my comment to that is that um, I trust that we're making um, our best judgment in how we reallocate our resources um, this budget year. Thank you. The, the if I can just, yeah. I want to make sure that we understand the scope of this work. Mm -hmm. That uh, if I heard you correctly, you were just uh, summarizing that we are going to reevaluate what needs to be done. But what this also does is take it to the next step of giving us a conceptual design of the work. Correct. It doesn't do the construction of the work, but we are going to a level that we have not been to before. It's potentially reevaluating the 08 study, but then going beyond that to here's the plan. Do you want the lower cost safety plan, or do you still feel like we need to find the money somehow to finance the full on major? Ret Retrofit renovation. I mean, that's the scope we're talking about, correct? And there, there probably would not be a reevaluation of the evaluation. I think we're just moving straight into de preliminary design. We won't get into detailed plans and specifications at this time, but we'll get enough design so that um, we can do a constructability review and have enough information for a contractor or anybody who's done contracting to say, you know what, based on these um, materials and estimated labor, we can estimate this will be a 1.5 to $2 million project. So we'll get a much better number and understanding of what it's going to take and how long it's going to take um, so that we have, when we come to you with the next fiscal year budget, we have good numbers. And this $70,000 budget adjustment is being requested from the budget adjustment of the town council, transfer from the general fund to the capital improvement program reserve. So there is money available in the capital reserves to pay for this 70000 So I think you made an important point that I want to clarify again. Is we're not basically redoing what we paid for in 08. Correct. So I think that's an important distinction I to make, that, 
that you're using the 08 money or 08 uh, study to then move forward with this services contract. Right. It's the same company that did the evaluation. They're familiar with the building. They know it seismically doesn't meet code. Now the next step is, okay, what do we need to do to meet the code? Right. Okay. Vice Mayor, you got another, another follow-up? Well, use the term of preliminary design. So just for expectations management, does this process and this contract give us I'm going to call it an actionable design to say, yeah, we want to do this, let's go forward, or is it a preliminary design which will then take a <laughs> final design and then you go to construction? Right. Where, where are we in that <clears throat> continuum? Um, usually there's three phases, preliminary design, detailed design, and final design. And so this will take us through preliminary. I don't know how much we'll get into detailed design, but um, I would say maybe a 50% design. It's probably about where we'd be. So we'd still, when we come to council, if we move forward with a recommendation with the next fiscal year budget to say, okay, we want to move into the next phase, which is detailed design plans and specifications that we can go out to bid. We'd bring back to council, because I'm sure it's going to be over $100,000, and say, this is the plan, these are specifications, we want you to prove that so we can go out to bid. And then at that time, it would be advertised, and then contractors would submit bids, and we come back for the award. And, at the, and so, again, it's, there are several steps along the way before we go to construction where the council will be uh, reviewing and approving the project. So um, do, were you able to finish your comments? <coughs> no, I'm, I'm okay. fine. Thank Councilman you. Councilmember Muller, did you have uh, additional comments to make about the item? Um, I, I support it. I mean, I just think we've really dodged a big bullet for a long time with this building and, and earthquakes and being kind of where we are you know, not on the San Andreas Fault, but pretty darn near. So uh, I, I certainly think that this is going to lead us down that path, but, uh, you know, we will have, you know, stopgap measures in place once we kind of get more information. So at this phase, I'm willing to, to move forward. Thank you. Vice Mayor Dornbecker? Yes, I agree. Thank you. Vice Mayor? Yeah, I agree. I, th I think that... Again, I'll state it like I said before. I'm glad that there's a phased approach, not just the have to do it all at once. Um, the basics of this building is, I think it's pretty established. It's not a safe building in, in the modern world and in, in, in what we do face. And we can't ignore it. I know people don't want to spend the money. I don't want to spend the money. People don't want to finance it, but we have to. I think we have to keep moving forward. So I, I think this is the right way to do it, and I certainly support it. Thank you. And I won't restate what uh, other council have already said that I agree, but um, I do want to point out this has been council direction for a long period of time, and so it totally makes sense to move forward. It also makes sense not only to uh, contract services with a known quality uh, company, but also to really build from the 08 study. We're not asking somebody else to evaluate what was done by the one company in 08. We have those same people that are knowledgeable already, so there should be a much shorter, if non-existent, learning curve. So let's make the most of this contract. We cannot continue to ask the public to come into this building and our staff to come here every day and work here and, and feel like we're not putting them at some level of risk. So I don't think we have any option at all other than to move forward as expeditiously as possible. So with that, is there a motion on this item? I move that we approve resolution number 3005-11, approving professional services agreement for $34,389 with pound management and a $31,611 amendment with Architectural Resources Group for the Town Hall Seismic Retrofit Project, CF-0001, and approve a budget adjustment 2011-2012 07, increasing appropriations in the amount of $70,000 in the Capital Improvement Fund, account number 50-6000-5100 from the Capital Improvement Fund balance. Is there a second? To second. That? All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you for reading that resolution. <laughs> I think that was all of phase one of the project, reading that <laughs> resolution. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Okay. And thanks, staff, for uh, really doing a thorough explanation so that we can make sure we know what we're getting there. Let's move, continue to try to move expeditiously along here to item C, other post-employment benefits policy update. Yes. Thank you, Mayor, Council. 
The policy before you this evening is an update of the town's OPEP funding policy. OPEB, which is our other post-employment benefits, as you say, is a benefit offered to town retirees who meet the vesting requirements approved by council in 2009. The town's current OPEB policy was adopted in June 2008, and that policy is in its last year, 2011-12. During development of the budget, council directed staff to develop an updated policy for review and approval. The current policy established a formula to allocate OPEP costs to all operating departments based on a percentage of full-time salaries. The percentage has increased over the four years of the current policy, starting at 3.75% and increasing each year to the current 7%. The new policy, as proposed by staff, would continue this philosophy of increasing the percentage each year for the next three years until the rate reaches 10%. Each 1% increase to the funding rate equals approximately $18,000 in additional cost to the town's operating budget. While the payroll surcharge is one defined method of funding the town's OPEB liability, council has also been successful in allocating additional funds when they are available, and that has provided $573,800 in additional OPEP funding over the past three years. The new policy recommends that council continue to consider allocation of future unassigned fund balance to OPEP. The chart shown on page one of the staff report shows the five-year history of OPEP funding. For the past four years, the town has funded above the current year retiree health benefit expense, which is also known as pay-as-you-go. The town established an irrevocable trust fund in 2010-11 and funded it with an initial deposit of $559,000 last fiscal year, and we will be funding an additional $179,000 this year for a total of $738,000. These funds are invested in a portfolio that is projected to earn 6% over the long term. The most recent actuarial valuation at June 30, 2009, reported an accrued liability for benefits of $2,177,000. Our current funding level of $738,000 is equal to 34% of the total liability. Also included with the staff report is attachment two, which is a page from the last actuarial valuation report. And that shows a chart of what the rate would be to fully fund the annual required contribution per the actuarial calculation. And it is over 16%. However, in conclusion, staff is asking council to adopt the resolution approving the OPEP funding policy. And fiscal year 2012-13, the rate would be 8% of full-time salaries increasing in 2013-14 to 9% and in 2014-15 to 10%. And again, considering approval of additional funding allocations to OPEB at the time that unassigned funds become available. And staff feels this gives council the most flexibility on how to allocate funds when they are available. There's other things that we've been able to successfully do such as allocate to capital projects and build and continue to maintain our reserves. So that concludes my report, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. So this, this would be considered a minimum commitment of funding, this structure here? It's, I would say it's a commitment because it still leaves the flexibility of right. funding additional right. when and, it's available. And this is all, you're basically giving us the real numbers that match the council's discussion and guidance that we've gone through for months yes if not years and yes. I wouldn't say it's a minimum funding because we're recommending an increase no I, no step. but but I mean to say we can continue as I think Kathleen you mentioned at the very end there we can continue to overfund but this is what we're saying is our minimum commitment to funding it's not the minimum amount of money yes we can but this is our baseline yes and we can continue to that we would build in our budget discretion up front. yes go beyond that yes yeah. okay yes. Are there any questions, uh, further questions about the staff report? To my left, either. Council Member Moeller. Um, can you, I think just for um, a lot of people who haven't really spent as much time with this, when you say 
we would really need 16 percent to fully fund well that's per the actuarial calculation okay and the way but GASB 45 was stated was that once you have an actuarial calculation of your liability you can amortize it over 30 years and so given what our actuary did they did this estimate for what they call pre-funding which is establishing the trust so they did these calculations and came up with these estimates based on all the little factors they do as actuaries and it includes things like our estimated payroll how much they assume health benefit costs are going to increase and those types of things so that that's the factor that they came up with what's the factor the 16 the, those that's 16 percent okay. that's where that comes from the 16 the if I can ask for the 16 percent gets us to fully funded in the 30 year yes based, yes that's what it would take to get us there in the end yes as required by, of by the law yes Any other question that comes from Mueller? Nope. Comes from Hall. Um, just one. So, using what you've proposed here, the eight, nine, ten percent for twelve, thirteen, thirteen, fourteen, fourteen, fifteen. What percentage does that get us estimated to the uh, the coverage of the outstanding liability, the projected liability, or do we know that math? I mean, if sixteen percent is what you need to get to a hundred percent, ten percent, it's going to get you to sixty-five or sixty-seven. So what, what kind of unfunded liability are we going to have? Or do we know that math? Well, I don't think we'll have a, an updated number till we have another actuary. Actual study. review. Okay, so that, that's kind of my question. You right. need that to be able to see what this it, projection yes, would be. And I think yes, we had a prior meeting where we, were, we talked about maybe getting that sometime in the very near future. Right. We're required to get an actuarial study mm -hmm. once every three years. Every three years, right. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the next one is? It'll be due next year. Next year. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Very good. That's fine. Councilman Dorn Becker. No questions. Vice Mayor. No, uh, no questions at this time. Uh, Ed, would you like to engage in anything? <laughs> You're our public right now, so I'm looking at you. Okay. Um, with no public comment, we'll continue uh, discussion and, and possible action on this item. Um, I know that we have uh, discussed this quite thoroughly. Uh, I don't hear any other questions. Uh, if somebody would like to propose a motion or have further discussion, I would uh, recommend we do that. I have comments. Um, let's start. Uh, are there uh, comments, uh, Councilmember Dornbecker? No. Councilmember Muller? Um, I think that um, I'm fine with what we're proposing from 2014, 2015. I'm going to be very interested to. And I think I have a lot of questions for the actuary guy when he kind of comes in to talk. I've got a lot of questions about how we're encouraging people at 65 to go on Medicare versus <clears throat> us paying big numbers. And uh, and so I'm okay with the, with the part that we're getting ready to prove he, to approve here. I think after that, we're, again, where I might struggle with is at where is really our cutoff for you know, having our current taxpayer in Yonville pay this versus our future taxpayer. So um, I think I'm, my cutoff's about 10%. After that, that's where I'm really struggling. <coughs> At what point do we put it off on the future taxpayer versus the current taxpayer? So um, so for, for now, I'm fine with this. Councilmember Hall. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I would just make a couple of quick comments. and, and the first one, obviously, back to the staff report, and I know we don't have crystal balls and how we predict long-term rate of return. I will tell you that um, the general consensus in the marketplace is 6% is very aggressive. Um, that being the case, we would only hope that inflation would not rear its or continue to rear its ugly head, as it has not. However, medical inflation has, um, that being the case. I don't know which direction your actuary or our actuary will take this. Um, I, I am comfortable with the direction that it's taking. I would say that um, I'm not comfortable having unfunded liabilities, but I do respect that um, this is not one that many or, or frankly very very few organizations can actually undertake to have a completely funded liability. This is, a, uh, I think, a mixed model or a hybrid model that you can get away with because of 
um, the actual usage of the funds and the, the timelines um, that we're looking at. So I'm, I'm comfortable at least that directionally we're moving in the right direction and I, I could uh, move forward with this. Thank you. Vice Mayor. I'm not comfortable. I'm not surprised. I, I look at this very simply and it's kind of, it's what Council Member Mueller said. It has to do with looking at costs and saying, are we going to pay them now or are we going to make someone else pay them in the future? Um, and our state is headed towards bankruptcy on the same concept, in my opinion. Um, if we only do 10% as a payroll tax and we should be doing 16.7%, we're only funding 60% of what that liability. And I look at this like a reverse mortgage. What we're basically saying is we've got a liability. We need a monthly, we need a, we need a mortgage payment that is 16%. We're only going to pay 10%, so we're building up for the future, and someday that balloon is going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And I, I just don't think it's ever going to get any easier than it is today. It's only going to get harder in the future. I'm amazed at what our revenues are for the town right now, and they're coming in real well. If we can't get to 16.6%, or if we're always saying, well, we'll wait for two or three more years so the next actu actuarial report comes in, I, I, that's what we said three years ago. So. I think that we should have a three-year plan that steps it up from, I think we're at, what are we at, eight this year? Mm -hmm. We're at seven for the seven. current year. I think it should be nine or nine and a half next year, and I think it should be, you know, 12 percent and then 16 percent. It should be a three-year, get us to that point. Um, that's, I, I just don't see another, any other way, or we are just saying it's fine for us to spend the money now and pay for it in the future, and I, I very much disagree with that. Thank you. Uh, um, Councilmember Dornbecker, do you have additional comments? Yeah. I'm sorry. Yes, now I do. But um, there is nothing to preclude us doing as we did um, when we have the funds available to um, put them towards that um, that piece of it. So I I don't know. I, I understand what Vice Mayor is saying, but I think that this is a step-by-step -step approach, and we will get to 16 percent, but um, when we do the budget next year and look at it, well, there may indeed be funds that we can allocate to this that will help to, you know, defray what's coming in the future. Thank you. And, and I'll, I'll just uh, add on to that. Basically, we've had this discussion numerous, numerous times, and we have said every time, as we have done with other fund balances, we overfund them as Councilmember Dorenbecker just said, we overfund them as the funds are available. I think we have a very proactive vision in that regard. What I hesitate to do is handcuff us with a more aggressive pay structure. We're already going above, over and above what is legally required. I feel like we are staying within our means and beyond that by adding additional funds beyond this structure. That's why I was asking for the clarification earlier. This is our minimum commitment, and we are – in a position at our discretion to add more to it. But as we have done in some other fund balances that I was uncomfortable with, we have taken a very large number that we have committed to that. And we cannot go back on that without, um, I mean, technically we can undo a decision in most cases, but um, creating a $2 million water reserve fund, I wasn't prepared to go that high because I felt like we could always add that money down the road. But it, that was a decision we made. I think this is the same situation here. We can we can end up putting in 16 percent if we use our discretion to do that. Um, I just think this is a more appropriate um, and measured approach so that we don't have to start looking at, okay, what services are we going to cut instead um, because we have mandated that we're going to fund at a certain level. So I just think this, as staff said, gives us the most flexibility to, on a discretionary basis, continue to move forward uh, with the ultimate goal in mind of getting fully funded. I'd so. just like to add, if I might, that um, as Council Member Doran Becker stated, we can look at it during the budget, and if revenues continue to trend as positive as they have this year, we can also have a conversation later this fiscal year about allocating additional funds. Which we just uh, did a couple months ago. Yes, right. yes. So. Okay, so with that, if there's no further discussion, is there action to be had on this uh, proposal? 
I move that we approve resolution number 3006-11, approving OPEB funding policy for fiscal years 2012-13, 2013-14, and 2014-15. I'll second. Uh, can we have a roll call vote on it, please? Yes. Uh, Council Member Doran Becker. Yes. Uh, Council Member Moeller. Yes. Vice Mayor Chilton. No. Council Member Hall. Yes. Mayor Dunbar. Yes. Thank you. One. So four to one, that passes. Thank you very much, staff. Okay, we're rapidly approaching 10 o'clock, so let's move right on. I have a feeling we know the outcome of our next item. <laughs> so formally, we are going to find out what the final tally was for the Yonville representative of our Napa County Mosquito Abatement District opening. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Um, there is uh, one um, opening on that district, and we received at the close of the filing period one application from incumbent member Stephen Rosa. Council interviewed him earlier this evening and has submitted their vote tallies, and it is uh, unanimous to reappoint uh, Council Member Rosa to, excuse me, um, Mr. Rosa to the um, Napa County Mosquito Abatement District. And then with one clarification, I'm noticing that um, it's going to be a four-year term, but I need to clarify if the expiration is December 31st, uh, 2015 or 2016. So I'll talk with Mr. Maffei. So if we could just have the motion to approve for a four-year term. Yeah, motion. Uh, so the motion would be to approve that for a four-year term? Move to approve. Uh, we appoint uh, Mr. Steve Rosa to a four-year term on the Mosquito Abatement District Second. Board. Second. Second from the Vice Mayor. All in favor? Aye. 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 Since we already voted that way, I, thank you. And, and I'll just say, uh, I'm sure on behalf of the entire council, <laughs> a thank you very much to, uh, to Mr. Rosa. He's served us so very well on this uh, commission. And on occasion, there'll be a, a lone applicant for appointment, and we hope they do a good job. I think there's absolutely no question with the, the scope of experience he's already bringing to represent us uh, he's going to continue to do a, just a fantastic job for us so thank you again for being willing to continue your service staff informational reports i believe we have at least one yes mr mayor council uh, we had the pre-construction meeting for the sidewalk and traffic calming project which you awarded the last meeting um, the contractor would like to get going this month there are several locations around town where they'll be replacing sidewalks and, and planning uh, new constructing new sidewalks at uh, Veterans Memorial Park between the Bocce Courts and the new Champagne Drive crosswalk. They'll be building a path there. Uh, they'll be removing, replacing the path on the west side of Washington Street in front of Whistle Stop between Mulberry and Yaunt. And they'll be removing, replacing the sidewalk on the west side of Washington Street between Hopper Creek and Burgundy Way and Masonry near Padroni. Um, there's also traffic calming. They'll be building bulb outs on Mulberry east of the, uh, at the east end of the parking lot at the community center. And then there's various sidewalks around town. Um, just want to remind people that there'll be cones and barricades and uh, no parking. And so um, please be observant of the signage and uh, please use the other side of the street or the directions that the contractor gives. So uh, we just want to keep it safe out there. And we're uh, asked the contractor to, to um, make it as safe as possible and notify the public. We also ask the public to observe the signage and. Uh, all of the directions and uh, the project will probably take um, depending on the weather they could be done in the middle of January but if we get some rains that may uh, sl slow things down it's uh, it's a good time of year with uh, not a lot of tourists and people out walking about but um, uh, it's also we are at the whim of the weather and if it's raining we shouldn't be pouring concrete so that's good news my report thank you other staff reports no then let's move on to council meeting reports. We'll get to comments in a moment, but uh, meeting reports. Uh, flood control. I did attend today's flood control. Uh, ongoing updates about the uh, flood project. Um, it's, it moves so quickly that by the time I tell you about it now, um, it's already outdated, but they are making substantial visual improvements. A lot of what they have done in the past, it just never looked like there was much progress because it was out of public view, but they really are making substantial uh, progress now, returning parking lots, uh, returning uh, uh, public public space, that type of thing. So they're continuing to move forward. 
Also, they uh, uh, showed us 20-year uh, budget projections. And it was good to see from March the projections were actually going to be in a deficit. They were going to run out of money uh, by 2020. Now they are looking at a modest surplus by 2020 thanks to the uh, types of uh, funding they have been receiving. So let's hope that trend continues. Uh, Napa County Transportation and Planning Agency, uh, do you have any highlights, Vice Mayor? Um, yeah, I think the, the most important uh, public items that, that transpired at the last meeting, um, the Vine has received more um, grant money, I think it was mostly federal money, um, to replace more of the fleet. And my understanding, if I recall correctly, is that over like the last three years, including this, this will completely overhaul and replace the uh, modernize the, the Vine fleet, um, which is uh, is pretty great. Um, another thing that, that did happen, there's a MOU between the uh, Lake County Transit Authority and Napa County Transportation for uh, transfers between the buses that go back and forth. Um, Lake County actually has a bus that comes down to, I think, St. Helena uh, for the hospital, um, so people could transfer onto either system uh, back or forth. So that, that was uh, um, discussed and approved. And there's also some information about the Vine Route 29 which goes from Calistoga all the way down to the Vallejo Ferry and then to the BART uh, station. And uh, they're, they're continuing to make some changes to those timetables that, that sync up with the ferry and, and BART. And I have to say, from a year ago or so, which there was not that many riders to the amount of riders they're having today, it really has increased dramatically. And it's, it's, it's getting to the point where you would probably call it a successful project. So. Um, that will continue at least for the next year or two with the grant funding that exists for that. So those are the highlights. Uh, there was a lot of closed session items yet again we won't talk about. It. Do you have a report for Local Agency Formation Commission, LAFCO? LAFCO. Uh, we met yesterday. Um, I think the most substantive item is currently LAFCO is uh, undergoing a service review of law enforcement throughout Napa County. Um, there are four different law enforcement agencies. Um, the city of Calistoga, city of St. Helena, and city of Napa all have their own police departments. Um, Napa County provides sheriff's department for the unincorporated county. We have our contract here, and then there's also a contract with American Canyon. I did not really realize the, the fact that the structure that Yonville and American Canyon have are very different. Um, they essentially have their own police department that's just staffed the sheriff's department uh, so it's quite a different structure um, so one thing that that we discussed was making sure that preliminary uh, drafts there was a very preliminary draft that was presented to the commission yesterday that those are shared with all the jurisdictions um, and that we can get feedback earlier rather than later and um, also the commission asked um, staff to go a little deeper into the different structures that exist in the county so people can understand some of the, um, when we talk about consolidation of services, there's an example in this county right now, very different levels of consolidation where Yonville is completely consolidated with the county when it comes to sheriff services. American Can Canyon is partially, and uh, the other uh, cities are not. And if you look at Calistoga and St. Helena, to no surprise, their cost of service especially on a per capita basis, is extremely high compared to Napa and, and the county, which makes sense. I mean, they're small. So that's, uh, that's what's going on at LAFCO. <clears throat> Thank you. Watershed Information Center and Conservancy of Napa County, Council Member Hall. Yes, and we – I'm um, oh, sorry, just one, I'm sorry? one more follow-up on the Vice fine. Mayor. Sorry, I forgot. The next meeting for LAFCO is February – in February of 2012, and I have been appointed the chair of LAFCO for next year. So that's all I have to say. Better not miss that meeting. No. <laughs> okay. Council Member Hall. Thank you. Yes, uh, Watershed Information Conservation Commission met on the 17th of November. Um, it was a, actually a really informative meeting. Um, talked a lot about the uh, report on the climate action plan from uh, unincorporated areas in Napa County. Um, the Groundwater Resource Advisory Commission also did a presentation, which we, we continue to hear more and more about this advisory committee that's getting 
created and, and how they're moving forward. Um, the other things that were of a lot of uh, what I thought were significant interest, and hopefully the committee will as well, um, there's an update on the Napa County Voluntary Oak Woodland Management Plan implementation. And what this is is the re-oaking of Napa Valley. Um, not that I want to su suggest there is a potential conflict with the tree lighting, but December 8th um, at 4.30 p.m. down at the, uh, at the Cal Academy, and then again at 6.30 p.m. there's actually one of those IMAX films about the reoking of Napa Valley and what this all is going to look like. So it kind of sounded like a slick thing to check out, but uh, obviously some people here may have conflict. Um, there was also uh, an update on the inter uh, where was this again? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, as discussed earlier today by um, Jim Shoup, where he talked about Measure A and the projects that had, had gone on, um, where we're at in the current life of Measure A, there was a lot of updates to that as well. It was a really sort of informative presentation about where the money has been spent, you know, what's yet to be spent, et cetera. And that, that was sort of the beginning of my basis of questions for that because, you know, there really was, and Yachtville did benefit actually quite a bit from all this Measure A money that came back in. Um, we don't have a lot of money left to spend, if you will, based on what was allocated to us, and this stuff is all going away. Um, my recollection uh, off the top of my head is that there's one more project that, one more project to still be bid and present. That will be a, a, a creek project from, I want to say, from the Oakville Cross all the way down to the Yonville Crossroad, where it probably touches us at the very end. Um, but that was really the last item with regards to Measure A funds that had not been allocated or not been sourced yet. So um, that being the case, it was, again, a pretty informative meeting. Um, you know, people, uh, pe people have a lot of uh, interest in what's going on in, in the watershed here in Napa County. We, we actually are, are very well um, recognized throughout the country and even globally for how we manage our watershed. And so um, what we in Yonville play an important part of that. Thank you very much for that report. I'll move on quickly to uh, League of California Cities North Bay Division Executive Committee meeting. I'm going to uh, combine meetings. I was I attended the League's Legislative Leadership uh, Conference down in San Diego. Uh, a highlight of that actually was a presentation from the Secretary of the Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation, Matthew Cate. Uh, it's not very good news. Uh, uh, as it uh, pertains to realignment and, and early prison release, prisoner release, and uh, changes in sentencing, uh, we are going to be seeing a substantial number of uh, prisoners released uh, from overcrowded prisons as mandated by the courts. And uh, the sentencing, some of the sentencing laws are changing so that people are not going to prison in the first place they will be going to county jail or not even being um, uh, sentenced uh, based on overcrowding and, and uh, some of the laws that are being changed. So we just need to continue to monitor that here in Napa County and how that affects um, our county services, basically. So I just mentioned that because we do have our uh, county jail down at the south end of the valley, and we just need to continue to monitor those developments. Uh, I won't go into some of the other details of the conference um, but we did set up uh, the 2012 strategic goals and meeting schedules for the North Bay Division of the League, uh, of which I am president. So um, I think it really benefits us to do, stay engaged in that advocacy effort. Uh, moving on, any other council reports that we missed before we go to comments? I if, just wanted to add one thing on NCTPA. Vice Mayor mentioned uh, the new buses, but. Yonville will actually right. be getting a new trolley. Yes. So yeah, we reported on that. that uh, I think that happened uh, a few months ago, actually. It was approved. Uh, but this I don't think the money. it's... Oh, this is the actual funding. That's, yeah, that's yeah, even better. Funding, yeah. And then eventually we'll see an actual vehicle. Yes. <laughs> yes. Great. That's that phased-in approach again. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think to that point, uh, just as we're talking about that, they did say that the lead time, and they didn't talk about specific ones, but certain buses have lead times that are in the years. And once you put the contract and you, and you do it, then they, they build it to order. So it's not like there's a Ford dealership with all the buses on them. <laughs> so um, it's not necessarily forthcoming, so don't look for it <laughs> when you go out right. there. But it, it's, it is coming, hopefully, I don't know if it'll be next year, but in the future. Well, and. and uh Funny you should bring up the car dealership. We basically did have a trolley 
that was unused down in the city of Napa that we ended up yes. getting renovated and adopted. So we did bypass that very, very slow exactly. uh, acquisition process. So we've been um, and happy to have that trolley here. Uh, let's go to uh, council comments. I'll start with Councilmember Dornbeck. Oh, well, thank you, Mayor. Um, first of all, I want to say thank you, though, in, in coming back to the League of California Cities North Bay Division, that um, I have been appointed to the Community, Community Policy Committee, and I thank you very much. Um, and um, Councillor Moeller has been appointed to Environmental Quality. Environmental Quality Executive Committee. So I will be having some reports someday of other things. But uh, as I was getting ready for work tonight, I realized that it was a year ago, um, today actually, that I was sworn in to be a town council member. And so I decided to do a little <clears throat> evaluation of um, myself and this situation. And I, I, the time has flown by. And um, I wanted to just say that I'm honored to serve the town of Yountville the veterans, the businesses, neighbors, and friends, and thank you again for putting me in the seat. I want to really thank the town council, Mayor Dunbar, Vice Mayor Chilton, Council Member Moeller, and Council Member Hall. I think that the town is very fortunate to have this group of people mm -hmm. representing you because we are all cordial and respectful and um, we are all reasonable also. I'd like to thank Steve Rogers and all the entire town staff and our town legal counselor. You've all been patient, supportive, and diligent. And as I've gotten to know each of you, I've liked you each more and more. I've learned a lot this year, and I'm sure that you know the curve is still uh, uh, upward for me. But I wanted to uh, say that I'm hopeful that through my efforts and those of Council Member Moeller, we will achieve my goal to have more library time available for residents. Um, I have a ways to go to achieve the goals, and I'm hoping that the 50th anniversary of the founding in Yountville in 2015 will provide an opportunity to provide some of the uh, goals I've set. For example, I still would like to see a kiosk in eastern Yountville to educate our visitors about the veterans' home. The Veterans Home is a very important part of our history and we're very proud and we cherish their part in our town. And I think that there may be a possibility as part of that celebration to get some funding and make that happen. I wanted to thank, uh, I'm working on the ad hoc committee with Council Member Muller and I'd like to thank her for bringing it up so we can get started in this planning process uh, in the next year. I'm hopeful that uh, someday we might be able to get that commercial hub that can be located in town to help the residents who do not have access to the internet and nor do they uh, travel that often into Napa. I'm sorry that my goal to raise the funds to purchase the Silver Twist was not one that many residents shared. <laughs> but the Art Walk and the programs of the Arts Committee continue to grow and provide beauty, culture, and a lot of pride for our town. So I'd like to thank the Arts Committee, headed by Rhonda Shear, Rob Wennerberg, and Kimberly Cook. And finally, let me th say thank you again for the pleasure of serving. Thornton Wilder wrote, I almost got through it all. <laughs> Thornton Wilder wrote, we can only be said to be alive in those moments when our hearts are conscious of our treasures. I feel very alive and very grateful to live and serve in Yachtville. Thank you very much. And I will be certainly hiring you for my State of the Town address <laughs> in, in early 2012. It would be my pleasure. Thank you very much. Pro uh, bono. Yes. Uh, comments, any com comments, Councilmember Muller? No. Councilmember Hall. Uh, only one, very brief. Uh, it, it was mentioned earlier tonight, and I'll, I'll just echo that again, um, at how nice the town looks and has looked the last several months and, and I know it's due to all the, the efforts the, the town staff but um, I mean it came to me on multiple on multiple occasions from people who either knew or didn't know that I uh, resided in Yonville and or was on the town council so um, you know kudos to our staff and, and the wonderful job they've done on town I mean throughout the entire community it really it really does look nice and uh, and 
I think it was said earlier, you know, it's it's a treat to be able to drive in from out of town or just to be able to be here in town all the time and enjoy it. It really has looked fantastic, and that's uh, that goes out to everyone, everyone in the community as well, because we're all doing our part. But I just wanted to mention that. I'd heard it on multiple occasions. Thank you. Yeah, Mother Nature has, has, has not hurt us. helped us out quite a bit this year. Vice Mayor. Um, I have one item to add. I'm going to call it breaking news because I got a phone call while – I was sitting outside during the Napa Valley Lodge um, a discussion, but it, I just want to make an announcement. Um, I got a phone call that uh, this coming, well, I guess it's not this coming Tuesday, it's a week from, uh, no, it's, it's a week from today. Um, the superintendent of schools, Patrick Sweeney, is hosting a, they called it a community meeting, so I invite everybody to the community, um, over to Yonville Elementary School from 5 to 6 on December 13th. Um, and the topic of discussion that he wants to talk with the community about is adding sixth grade back at Yonville Elementary School in the future. Um, and that's as early as next year. It's something that we have been working with the district on. I think it was in the paper, uh, uh, sort of those discussions about enrollment. Um, but specifically, uh, there's going to be a community-wide meeting about sixth grade. So uh, we've received a tremendous amount of support from folks. Um, um, both in spirit and in their pocketbook uh, over the last year and a half to keep the school open. And uh, having people that are not just parents but community members there would be very, very uh, helpful just to see that support for the school once again. So that would be, again, next Tuesday, December 13th from 5 to 6 p.m. over at Yonville Elementary School in the multi-purpose room, which is the, the large cafeteria slash room. Well, they they use it for all kinds of things. Um, right in the middle of campus. So that's that's what I got. Thank you. Uh, very quickly, since we're almost out of time, uh, I just wanted to thank all of the folks that helped out with Breakfast with Santa. Uh, it was really a fun event and helps kick us right into that holiday spirit. Uh, and the same theme, this Thursday at 530, we will be lighting the uh, town Christmas tree uh, right outside of Community Hall. And all loyal young villains will be in attendance. Um, and that is also in conjunction with the uh, Chamber of Commerce mixer. So that's always, a, again, a really great opportunity for people to uh, uh, kick it into high gear for some holiday cheer and some good uh, community time. I, I do want to also thank all the folks that made the Festival of Lights experience, again, very memorable. We had, um, you know, some folks didn't think that there were as many people as years past. There's, there seemed to me to be one of the largest crowds we've had in uh, recent memory. Uh, regardless, it was another really, really well done uh, event that, that lives on volunteers. And our volunteers were really, really challenged this November. We had so many major events that they had to keep stepping up for. And fortunately or unfortunately, the Festival of Lights is the end of that heavy month. So I just encourage everybody to not give up on, on that uh, volunteer service for our community because it really is appreciated and makes us very special. So as Councilmember uh, Dornbecker said, it's such a wonderful community in which we live, and that's one of the uh, many reasons that, that make it so. So I think with that, uh, we do have a list of future agenda items. Uh, and actually, we do have a member of the public that would like to come up. And we'll add you very quickly to uh, our council comments. Uh, I, I appreciate that I was not here earlier. I just wanted to mention to you that uh, next Wednesday, all four of our legislative representatives, both current and future, are going to be at the home. Uh, we're going to have a special award for Senator Evans, who past SB10 for us, and Assemblyman uh, Alan uh, Minya, uh, Yamada. Yamada and, um, and Walk will also be there. And you're, you all frequently come, and I welcome you on that day. And there is an Allied Council meeting in the morning, I believe. <laughs> that's, that's when they will be. Okay. Right, right. 930. Thank Great. you. Thank you very much for that update. And it's also important to uh, mention that we – We'll not be meeting again in December. Uh, so this is our only meeting in December. And we actually are, um, we did earlier uh, eliminate the January 3rd meeting since it fell so closely on top of the uh, holiday season. So um, 
<laughs> there is a list of future agenda items here. We'll get to those in 2012. Uh, so we are, I'm going to uh, ask that we adjourn to our next scheduled meeting, which is January 17th at 6 p.m. And I would ask that uh, we adjourn tonight's meeting in the memory of George Crane, who we did lose this last week, a member of our uh, community hall commission and just a, a very loyal uh, Yonfo resident, wonderful man. Our, our thoughts and prayers go out to his entire family tonight. So if we can adjourn in uh, memory of George Crane. Is there a motion to adjourn? Move to adjourn to January 17th. Thank you. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Good night. Happy holidays.